Okay, team, we are going to get started. We're still waiting for some um, uh, technical fixes to be worked out, but um, we're going we're gonna to get going um, as it's um, not a requirement that we have a um, video recording. So, um, so the first thing is to, um, well, I guess I'm going to call the meeting to order. So the first thing is um, just some logistics for this meeting. Uh, if you're joining us remotely, if you change your name to your first and last name so I can address you properly, um, that'd be great. Um, when you speak, if you could start by saying your name and where you live. Um, we are asking folks to keep their comments to two minutes or less, and Donna over here will help us um, with the time. Um, and uh, if, as long as you're speaking to something that is um, related to a, an agenda item, if you could just keep it germane to that topic, that would be great. If you have something to say that is not about um, something on our agenda, you can do that during <coughs> the general business and appearances. Um, and if you wish to speak, just make sure that I call on you first. Um, and uh, we, if you have multiple questions, if you could ask all those questions uh, consecutively, that would be great as we don't really get into like a back and forth um, kind of dialogue in this space. This is not really for that. Um, and I think that is, I think that is it. Um, all right, so the next thing is to review and approve the agenda. And uh, there are going to be some adjustments to the agenda. Um, specifically, we're going to reorder some of the later items. So after the appointment to the uh, restroom committee, let me just go back and see here. I think we've adjusted the online agenda. Oh, the online. OK, so the online agenda reflects the, the proposed changes. The proposed changes. I just want to make sure that that looks right, and it does, which is great. Okay, um, so just in case uh, folks are wondering, that means um, after the restroom committee appointment, we'll go with planning commission appointment. Um, then our audited financial statements, the Wrightsville Beach uh, Recreation District presentation, then the CVPSA item, uh, and then our budget presentation and uh, potential uh, local option sales tax charter change discussion, uh, utility status update, police presentation, and then um, uh, discussion around the composition of the Public Arts Commission. So that is our order. Anyone have any information to have it be something other than what I've just mentioned. Okay, so with that, we'll consider the agenda approved. So we're on to general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on any topic that is otherwise not on our agenda. Um, and uh, so if you would like to make a comment, now is the time, and there are multiple people who would like to make a comment. So um, you can just come up um, as you are ready, and there'll, there'll be a queue probably. You, I believe you can, yeah, that's also fine. Lumbering old man who has respiratory problems, so this makes life easier for me. Let's see, is this on? Yep. Is this on? Okay. So my name is Tom Mulholland. I live in the Lane Shops in Montpelier. And uh, council members, and is the proper form of address Madam Mayor? because I remember a show on TV, Madam Secretary, so I thought, well, it must, must be appropriate. Um, so <coughs> I'm, uh, <coughs> I'm part and parcel of uh, agenda item number 15, which has been euphemistically termed composition of the Public Arts Commission. And uh, <coughs> I don't mean to be uh, a bother to the, uh, to the council, uh, but you might appreciate that, whereas for you it is an agenda item, for me it's about my character being maligned, uh, which doesn't set well with me. And uh, so um, <clears throat> I see that it says here the council may wish to enter executive session under 1 VSA 313A 2, 3, and 4. And <clears throat> upon reading uh, that 
uh, VSA. Huh? It says that uh, for um, a disciplinary or dismissal action against a public officer or employee, I'm not an employee, so I must be a public officer. Uh, <clears throat> so this is a public body may not hold an executive session except to consider one or more of the following. And then so a disciplinary uh, or dismissal action against a public officer or employee. But nothing in this subsection shall be construed to impair the right of such officer or employee to a public hearing. And so I request that this discussion be taken place uh, in the context of a public hearing and not uh, executive session. Uh, I read the memorandum that was sent to all the uh, city council members and the mayor, and frankly, it's profoundly flawed, and I feel that if the council goes into executive session and bases their discussion and then subsequent decision upon that memorandum, that a profound injustice is going to be rendered onto me. And uh, so that's my request. And I can say right off the bat, there are some really gross omissions in that report. And also under the thing of like um, undisputed facts, I mean, within the body itself, you can see that the facts are disputed. Thank you. So we can, uh, it'll be up to the council as to whether or not we have, we go into executive session. And uh, I think uh, doing one does actually not also preclude doing the other. Um, and so that's something that we potentially could discuss um, there as well. Um, so thank you. Um, and we'll, I think we'll take up that discussion when we get to that um, agenda item. Okay, thank you. Uh, there are a number of other folks, uh, so come on up. Yeah. So we're going to get to the folks who are uh, with us in person first, and then we'll get to those who have their hands raised um, digitally. Hey, Welcome. Yeah. You mean the America Got Talent? So <laughs> I'm trying to do my best. Good evening. Uh, my name is Pelin Kohn, and I live uh, at 292 Westwood Drive, Montpelier. Excuse me. Uh, Could you move closer to the microphone? You really oh, just closer. Closer to me. Just have to be honest. So okay. Is it better? Yeah. Should I start again? Okay. Good evening. I am Pelin Cohn. I live uh, at 292 Westwood Drive, Montpelier. I uh, moved here in 2007 from Turkey. It seems very far away, but thanks to technology, I can still see my friends and my, my family. I have two kids, uh, 16 and 14. They are at Montpelier High School, and I'm dealing with their teenage drama every single day. So I think uh, I thought myself, okay, if I can deal with them, maybe I can apply for the city council vacancy <laughs> for District <laughs> 2. I think I am now strong enough to deal with like all different challenges. I know Connor is such a nice person, and he has done great things. It will be difficult to replace him, but I, I think I can also contribute great things um, through my international background and also my professional background. I work at Norwich University. I am the leadership program uh, chair and also leadership uh, center uh, director. Uh, my, one of my strengths is about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I uh, was very fortunate uh, to work or to serve on SAJAC committee uh, with our city councilor Jennifer and Lauren. And on that committee, uh, my team, we did great things. And uh, all the things I learned from them uh, make me think, okay, what can I do more? So I went and I attended um, graduate certificate program at um, Cornell University, and I got my certificate. And I start applying all this knowledge in my work. And um, 
I want to apply for this position and also I want to run for the city council in upcoming election and I want to bring all those experience to our city uh, because since the first day everybody uh, was so helpful to me whenever I need help thanks to front porch forum of course you know I just type my problem and everybody's emailing offering help so I never truly uh, felt myself alone but it was a difficult um, sometimes challenging transformation uh, especially in Turkey we sit and like chatting but here everybody likes doing something and seeing their friends and one time my friend went to um, hike to the Hubbard Park and we forgot that I have asthma and I was almost killing myself. Now it is our joke, you know, among our friends. Do you remember that day you were almost killing to be socialized? I said, oh yeah, I remember. So uh, I want to bring my international perspective uh, and uh, my um, diversity, equity, inclusion, professional uh, and um, personal experience. And I know that demographic is changing and um, I just attending a meeting with one of the um, uh, federal, okay. So we are expecting 500 NIF uh, refugees. So I thought I might help. And um, thank you for giving this opportunity to me. I have to stop. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a, a question for you, uh, Pellin, if I can. So we will be uh, making this appointment at our next meeting, and do you anticipate attending that meeting to, um, I know you've just introduced yourself, but we'll be hoping that all of the folks interested in the District 2 appointment would be uh, present to, to introduce themselves um, then. Do you anticipate being here next time? Yeah, okay. I'm definitely uh, be okay. here. Thank you for yes. mentioning it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Great, go ahead. Hi, I'm Sandy Vitztoom, 14 Loomis Street. You may have heard from Front Porch Forum that my water reducer, uh, pressure reducer, uh, burst this weekend and caused damage um, in my tenant's apartment. Um, I was surprised in the consequences, learning that this is actually happening to many houses in Montpelier and possibly businesses as well. And the reducer itself is a small investment, but when it surprises you by blowing, uh, it can cause quite a bit of damage. Um, we lost a hot water heater, and I heard that one condo up on Murray Hill lost all of its floors, and then the condo below it also did. So um, I understand it's a serious problem, and there's been, there's been good coverage in the bridge in Vermont Digger recently about this, um, but and and I am totally <laughs> uh, in, uh, admire our Public Works Department because I know they're doing everything they can and they get out as quickly as they can to solve problems. But I'm hoping that the captains of our civic ship, which are you folks, with the help of Public Works, could do something a little more proactive because it is quite disturbing to have 200 pounds of pressure, 200 PSI, all of a sudden going through your pipes in your house. Um, it literally explodes out of your kitchen faucet. Um, it, it, it's, it's really disastrous. So to be proactive, I know you folks are already working on bigger issues. Our city water pressure is twice that of the maximum recommended, which is really significant and puts a lot of pressure on that reducer all the time, which is why they finally blow. But I would like you folks to be proactive in a small way, I think it's an easy way, to simply send a letter to every landowner and to every resident in Montpelier preparing us all for that possibility. If people could, if they know that they've lived in the house for 10 or 20 years and they haven't replaced the reducer, they should probably just go ahead and do it. Also, you can put two reducers in line so that if the first one taking all that pressure blows, the second one can take over. The third thing you can do is put a 100 PSI relief valve right behind the reducer. So if the reducer blows, the relief valve will go 
and just your basement will be wet, not your whole floors of your house. So if you could write a letter to everyone and let them know, I, I, I feel like it would help citizens understand that, that, that we're acting as a community here to solve a bigger problem. The other thing to do is to let people know the warning signs, which I did not know. All of our toilets started to leak, you know, the little sound. That's actually a warning that your, produ your reducer is going. And um, the other thing is uh, things like, you know, uh, beginning to get drip condensation or drip out of your hot water heater. So I didn't know those warning signs. It would be so helpful if people could. And, and then just this sense that we're all working on it. I should also point out that the dirt from the first Loomis Street break was part of the problem. It gets into the reducer. So um, just letting people know, if you've already had one break on your street, you should probably go and check your reducer. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to comment on that. Thank you, um, Sandy. And th thinking about the possibility of including something in the water bills, um, that's easy. We include other letters in those water bills already, so that seems like that could be an easy thing to do. Yeah, cool, thank you. Yep, yeah. I took a lot of notes on that. We are actually gonna be, the public works director is gonna be addressing this issue tonight, but this is a great idea, so yeah. thanks. Thank you. Steve Whitaker, Montpelier. Um, the alternate side, I picked up a couple tickets on School Street. Uh, there's no marking. I was on the alternate side following the rules, and there's no signs indicating that why I'm getting tickets, you know. Um, so I will challenge those tickets. But I have to question what the purpose of the alternate side parking in is when we have snow and when we all park on the other side, we still don't plow. So it's just, you really should suspend the alternate side parking if you're not gonna hold up your end of the bargain. You know, the whole purpose of it was to provide a clear access to one lane at a time for plowing. But if you don't have the staff or whatever list of excuses you got, uh, it's really unfair burden to put on the public. Uh, the MOU with the transit center is on the consent agenda, so I have to speak to it here. Um, the transit center handicap doors are still not working. Steve, uh, if I can interrupt you, um, I would, I'd be happy to pull that item off and then you could speak to that specifically during um, the consent agenda. If you'd like to speak to that then. That's fine. Okay. Um, so yeah, that if you'll pull that off, I would sure. not have to try to compress it into this two minutes. Um, oh, Elm Street, I know that w the shim shimming around the storm drains uh, has not happened since we didn't get the quality we needed in our paving at the intersections, but Elm Street specifically is so rutted that the water accumulates there and then it gets the dry, the cars drive by and splash whoever's walking by and or it splashes up onto the sidewalk and freezes. And it, when that happens, it's not necessarily when there's salting and sanding going on everywhere else. It's, it's a specific problem of road standing water. And so it's a, it should be a priority to just shim those puddles on Elm. Uh, there's also some valves creating huge ice patch at the alley next to uh, Three Penny. Uh, uh, can, your street supervisor recognized that because he said there's two receivers there. There's side by side uh, storm drains, and that's unique. So that's a big problem. There was a yards and yards of glare ice bubbling up from a leaking meter. But I wonder why we got such a staff that I'm, ha I'm the one that has to call this to your attention. Thank you. Anyone else with us in person wish to make a comment? Yes. Greetings, folks. Um, I'm Dan Toll uh, from a Montpelier resident here on First Avenue. 
And I came here tonight for two reasons. Um, the second reason is to just talk very briefly about the uh, task force, the homeless uh, task force project. However, um, the, the first topic I wanted to talk about is something very near and dear to my heart. As all of you know, um, I was part of the Montpelier Review, uh, Police Review Committee and got the opportunity to work under phenomenal leadership of Alyssa uh, Sharon as the chair, as well as two of our illustrious town leaders, Jack McCullough and Lauren uh, Hurl, fellow uh, committee members and, of course, um, part of your council. But I'm not here to talk about the committee. I think you all have figured out what I, what I am here to talk about, and that's Chief Brian Pete. Uh, I can't tell you how long I cried when I heard Brian was leaving. Working with Brian during that, that police review committee was, uh, I, not that I've had a lot of interaction with the, with the law enforcement, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, can, I can tell you very honestly, I have not met a law enforcement professional in my 64 years like Brian Pete consummate professional, uh, in my opinion, someone who always takes, tries to take the high road. Um, he's, he's bright, he, he cares, he's a very compassionate human being, and I'm so sad he's leaving, but I know he's gonna do some great things uh, in Kansas, <laughs> and we'll be hearing about it probably on, you know, he'll be, they'll be interviewing him on PBS, the nightly news, for all the great <laughs> things he's doing for the Midwest. And maybe, but maybe he'll come back and visit us when he's, you know, this illustrious world law enforcement leader. So I could stand here all night and talk, but I don't want to get the one minute sign from Donna. <laughs> <laughs> so I will, I will, I will, on this topic, I'll finish on the, on the note that in honor of Brian, I brought two things tonight. Um, something sweet and something healthy and practical, which I'll leave in back. Chocolate chip cookies and oatmeal cookies. <laughs> Very nice. Thank you. Brian, big hand for Chief Pete. We love you, man. <laughs> We're going to have a chance to roast him later on tonight, too. What? So. We're going to have more chance to roast him later on tonight. But I can't I, I stay do. because I have this big project I'm working on, yeah, so right. I have to go home and get to work. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, uh, I just wanted to give you a quick update. Um, Bill and I have had several conversations about giving an update to you, and because of the budget, the intensity of the discussions tonight and next week on the budget, what we had talked about is um, – Paul, my partner, and I are going to be putting together, we've, we're, we are putting together just a very small handful of pages that's going to be in your packet for next week. Um, it'll, be there, it'll be there for you to review. I would love it if you could take a few seconds, a few minutes, just to look to see if there's anything that jumps out that's missing or, no, or that's missing or you don't have questions. And if you would like me to come to public comment next week, I'm happy to, to answer questions. But... In talking with Bill, what we decided is we're going to do a, a formal, uh, a more formal presentation at the next meeting on January 11th. So that'll be the opportunity for us to give you a full update and for you folks to have, for us to have a, a, a substantive dialogue. Because Bill said we're going to be able to carve out some substantial time to talk about housing and more, and as importantly, homelessness. So unless you have any questions now, I'm going to put out the healthy and the not so healthy and head home to get to work. Well, thank you so thank much. You. <laughs> <laughs> Zach Hughes, uh, Prospect Street, Montpelier. Um, two things tonight, and I may come back 
at another meeting on the other one, uh, depending on how things go. For a second, Zach. Steve, could you take that outside, please? Sorry Thank you. That. Sorry about that. All right. Um, so the first item, uh, I, I, I'm aware there's going to be appointments on the restroom committee. Um, did want to just give you all information that Carolyn and Carolyn Ridpath and myself were designated by homelessness task force two years ago. So I don't know how that plays out if, um, anyway, so that's okay. I want to reiterate, because you might hear comments about this uh, from us, um, but for me, as a citizen, it's important to really work on this restroom thing. Um, you know, we're, I know we've really been working on it, but there's been a couple years delay, but it's really difficult to find a bathroom once in a while sometimes. and. I just want to lay that out there. I know we're doing that later. And um, the other thing I just want to say is that um, I also want to give my um, thanks to uh, Chief Pete um, for all the work and all the uh, work in the Montpelier Police Department and continuing the excellence of the department. And uh, I hardly knew you, Chief Pete, but I will. Um, Miss you, look forward to uh, hearing the news exploits out of Kansas. Um, <laughs> and I'm aware of the joke about uh, sending people to Kansas on the bus. Uh, we'll try not to do that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Zach. Anyone else with us in person wish, wish to make a comment? Okay. All right, so we're going to go to folks who are with us uh, digitally, and we'll start with Ken Russell. Go ahead. Hey, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Ken Russell. I live outside the environs of Montpelier, east of Montpelier, called East Montpelier. Thank you for letting me serve on your task force, the Homelessness Task Force. I uh, come tonight um, because our, our task force has wanted me to carry a message of urgency on the um, restroom committee work and the restroom work. Um, and we've twice now passed a resolution this fall. Um, and, you know, we're all friends here and we're also working to get some stuff done. So um, appreciate Bill's good work on the committee. And there are some logistical challenges in making this happen. But we do um, are aware that this has been lingering for a long time. And we want to express a strong sense of urgency um, at, at the highest levels um, in the city for getting this done. So um, those are my remarks. Thank you, Ken. Uh, we'll next go to Phil Dodd. Go ahead. Good evening. Good to see you. And thank you for uh, having this Zoom option available. Uh, I had comments in, in three areas. Uh, the first is about the Confluence Park. I read last week that estimates for building Confluence Park had doubled to 2 million. And Bill Frazier told me today the estimates are now as high as 3 million. I would urge the council to put the project on the shelf or cancel it. That's a lot of money for a tiny park, and its location means it would probably continue to be a hangout for the unhoused and little used by the public. Uh, there are probably better uses for the money. Uh, next, I found the recent VT Digger articles about the water system and its high pressure eye-opening and concerning. Having a water main break every other week on average is too often, and I have to think that the number of breaks will increase over the 50-year pipe replacement plan. Since the articles came out, I've had several people tell me they have had to recently replace the water pressure reducer in their house. One neighbor said the device cost him $200 plus $150 for a plumber. This is a burden on residents. My suggestion is that the council consider appointing a citizen committee to study the complex issue and report back. Uh, the committee could talk to city staff, state regulators, experts, plumbers, and citizens. Uh, the more eyes we have on this, the better in my opinion. My final comment is about the local option sales tax, which I see is on the agenda. I was a strong proponent of the local option rooms and meals tax because it's a way for non-residents to help pay for our city services. But I'm not so sure about the local option sales tax. It has been turned down by voters two or three times already. It could adversely affect local merchants who are still suffering the effects of the pandemic uh, since state workers have not returned to Montpelier in a big way. And it is worth remembering that it would apply to anything delivered here. That means furniture purchased in Berlin, 
and delivered here would have the 1% tax added. The tax would also be added to online purchases at sites like Amazon. Given the number of delivery trucks I see in Montpelier, it seems likely that most of the revenue would come from residents, not non-residents. Uh, that's all I have. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Phil. All right, Carolyn Ridpath, go ahead. Carolyn Ridpath, and, and I live in, live in Montpelier. And I have I been, been on, on the, the uh, bathroom, bathroom committee since its inception on the SAC. And, and in the course, in the course of, that of that relationship, relationship numerous, numerous people, people have come to me and I have read in front page forum numerous, forum, numerous concerns, concerns about, about bathroom, bathroom facilities, facilities for a variety of different people in town, not just the homeless. That we, that we have old, old people, people who would who appreciate the facilities. We have, we have visitors. visitors. We have we downtown, downtown shoppers. shoppers. We have, we have people, people with little, little kids. kids. Everybody's, Everybody's got a little kid that had to go. Had to go. Um, um, so, so I think I it's think important, important to get that committee up, 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 operating, operating and, and uh, working, uh, working on, on this problem. problem. Okay, thank you. Uh, Peter Kelman, go ahead. Sorry. Um, yeah, I just wanted to just add a couple things on the bathroom issue. Uh, um, th this has been ki seriously kicking around for a couple of years now. And um, I know how hard it is to get a committee up and running because I've been on several of them. And I think this committee is not the only way to solve the problem. I, I think it should be, it should meet, of course. Um, I would like to urge that also that the city manager's office look into this independently or working with the committee, um, because there are a whole range of solutions that are possible. Some of them are going to take a longer time, amount of time, like make, doing a building, but some of them uh, might take much less time, like talking to the state about using some of their existing buildings and having them be open 24-7 and maintained and having that be uh, the word out about that. Another thing is to talk to Montpelier Alive and get the merchants to open up their bathrooms to uh, people who are not paying, they're, they're paying customers. That's not a, you know, not a requirement, but let's urge them to. Uh, you know, anyone who has traveled around the world will know that most towns or cities the size of Montpelier, and certainly every capital that I've ever been in, has enormous number of opportunities for people to use restrooms. It's actually a disgrace. And I don't think we need to wait for a committee to make recommendations, although, again, I value that. And Bill, I really think it is within your power to push ahead. And even our, even the city, city uh, you know, if you read, read uh, Front Porch Forum, people think, oh, you can go to the police station. No, you can't, because the police station bathroom is not open to the public because of a lack of staffing. Oh, you can go to City Hall. Well, yes, but not when it's, when it's, it's after hours. Let's open up the city buildings to for more time. Yes, it's going to take some, some, you know, supervision, some maintenance and so forth, but let's figure it out. Thank you. Thank you. All right, anyone uh, with us digitally wish to make a comment? One sec. Okay. All right, so with that, we're going to move on in our agenda. Thank you, everyone, for your comments. Um, so we're going to move on to the consent agenda um, and with um, the hope that maybe we can take off item A. Thoughts? Or is there a motion? You Go ahead, Jack. A motion to take it off. You don't need that. We don't need that. I move the agenda, the consent agenda, with the exception of item A. Okay. Okay. There's a motion and a second. Um, further discussion. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay. So, um, Stephen, if you would like to make a comment on item A, now's the time. Thank you. It's a good segue from what you just heard from Peter and others. It's not been two years. It's not been a year and a half since the Toilets Committee. It was three and a half years ago that the Homelessness Task Force was 
formed, and toilets were one of their first priorities. The transit center is grossly underutilized. It's owned by the city. It's, it's given to Green Mountain Transit for a dollar a year lease. Uh, those bathrooms should be open 24 hours. I think we should not just update this MOU with $18,000 for, you know, Good Samaritan or whomever to, to staff it and clean it. We should take, Green Mountain Transit should have only the glass enclosed cage. The city should maintain the entire building and keep those bathrooms open. One of those bathrooms has a five inch sewer line running directly under the unused corner. A shower could be put in there very easily. And there's a, the lockers that were just a huge fiasco and waste that we invested in lockers. So put a wall of lockers there, air, airport size lockers where people could actually store a, a sleeping bag or a backpack. There's a picture in the New York Times of a hotel in New York that was converted. That I'm happy to forward that photo. But my point is that this is, we have not even maintained or insisted on enforcement of the lease terms to keep those bathrooms open between 11 and 2.30. So we're allowing them without challenging them to save money on employee benefits by closing the bathrooms when the lease requires them to be open. So they are in violation of the lease. We should cancel the lease or narrow their lease to the footprint of the glass cage and open those bathrooms and have the city take over management of that property. That's the most immediate, as well as the city hall bathrooms downstairs. Immediate solution, and there's no excuse for dragging anchor on it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any further discussion? Uh, Jack. Thank you. Uh, this issue of the, uh, the transit center and what uh, Green Mountain Transit's obligation is has come up repeatedly in the past. I wonder if the manager could uh, explain uh, what the, the situation is with that. So a couple things. Um, the city can't actually use that property for anything else other than transit because it was uh, funded by federal transit money. So GMT, even though we're the owner, GMT has really veto power over anything that's done in there, as does federal transit. Um, the agreement with them is that they will maintain public bathrooms uh, while they are present to the extent that they're able to staff. And uh, I think perhaps Stephen is right about why they're not staffing, but they get their funds from the state and uh, they are unable to, they don't, they don't have the financial resources to staff. We've asked them to staff uh, fully. When they are open, they, the bathrooms are open. Uh, so it's been an ongoing conversation with them, but we're not really in a position, uh, it's an odd situation with that we're the building owner, but we don't really have the final say over its use. So uh, we, uh, unless we could prove that they are, that they're, lying when they say they don't have the right. financial resources to operate it we can't there's nothing we can really do to force them Correct. to keep it open more hours thanks all right is there further discussion or a motion i move we approve the memorandum of understanding i'll second it further discussion okay all in favor please say aye aye, aye. and opposed all right thank you uh, okay, so we have a number of appointments to make, and I, um, I think we have, do we have any, any of them here? Um, what I'd like to do is, uh, if any of the folks who are here for uh, an appointment would come up and introduce themselves, um, that would be great. Uh, so Elaine Ball, I don't see Elaine Ball with us in person, not sure about digitally. Um, okay, so uh, Lucinda McLeod, you here. Okay, how about uh, Mary Alice Bisbee? I don't see Mary Alice. Uh, Kim Ward. Nope. Uh, Jennifer Brown. Okay, and uh, Maria Arsenlis. 
Okay. All right, so um, we could go into executive session. Um, we don't have to, but um, thoughts on appointments? I move that we enter into enter executive session to discuss the appointment of a public officer or employee on all three of those <coughs> items pursuant to one BSA section 313A3. And to be clear, we're going to be discussing all of those appointments. Yes. Okay. Okay, so there's a motion and a second. Peter Kelman, go ahead. Yeah, I, I'd just like to make an observation that the city council needs to make clearer to appoint and or the city manager to people who are applying for committees that it would be a good thing for them to show up at a meeting and to, make, and to, to present themselves, unless you don't want them to. Look at this. Nobody showed up because it's not clear in the entire process. If you go to the website and see what, what it, what's involved in applying for a committee, fill out this form, period. If that's really what you want, okay. But if you want people to show up and talk, you need, we need to do more to let them know that they should do that. And I think they should. Thank you. Um, so, um, yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, and any further discussion? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay. We aye. will be right back. Check, check. Woo. That is. Okay. We, we're good. Okay. Uh, okay. So, um, is there a motion to come back into exe uh, back f to public session? Pe session. Yes. Whatever. Move to come out of executive session. Okay. Second. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. And opposed. Okay. Uh, is there a motion regarding appointments, Jack? I move that we make the following appointments: to the Historic Preservation Commission, Elaine Ball; to the Planning Commission, Maria Arsenlis; and to the Restroom committee to be clear that uh, everyone knows what we're doing, that we reappoint all the current members of the public restroom committee and also further appoint Lucinda McLeod, Mary Alice Bisbee, Kim Ward, and Jennifer Brown. Second. Okay, there's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Uh, yes, Donna back because we didn't set any terms and usually we have alternate terms on a committee. Well the, the planning commission has set terms. So she's filling out a unfilled term I believe. Okay. Um, or the, the new, <laughs> new rest, the restroom committee I don't know if they right. have terms. Would we need to establish terms right or it'll just be until the project's done. <laughs> but, but good call. Well, that's good to note. They're on until there's a bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, great. Uh, and thank you to all who put their names forward uh, to serve. That's great. All right, so we're on to our uh, FY22 aud audited financial statements, and I know uh, we have some folks here uh, to uh, tell us about that. So come on up. It doesn't usually take us an hour to get to this part of the meeting. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> yeah, you can. Do you have a, a presentation? It's gonna okay. I may move so that I can see it. Oh, it's bedtime. I mean, I can talk. <laughs> Just for the, the benefit of the council and the public, uh, Kelly Murphy, uh, acting finance director and um, assistant city manager. And then um, with me, I've got RHR Smith, um, our auditors. Um, this is Miranda McDonald and Ron Smith. And then online, um, Heather Graves, our senior accountant, is also available for questions. Um, and so I'm going to hand it off um, to go through the audited financials. Um, they will be posted online shortly. Um, we have physical copies in the room. and. Um, I'll leave it to Miranda. All right. 
Good evening. Um, as Kelly said, my name is Miranda McDonald. Oh, so one minor. Share your screen. Love technology. Well, we just completed our audit, and um, for your purposes, on page one. There's a letter and it gives our opinion. And in our opinion, the financial statements prevent, present fairly in all material respects. So um, this is an unmodified opinion from old language. The first schedule we're going to present can be found on page 17 of the financial statements. This is the balance sheet. Um, most people look at, you see the first column is your general fund, and you look at your fund balance. So for your general fund, your unassigned fund balance for FY22 is just a li little over $2 million. Um, your non-spendable includes inventory prepaids and then restricted and committed or um, those items that have been voted by your the voters and um, y'all to reserve some of those funds. Um, I do want to point out the capital projects. Uh, you have a non-spendable of 2.9 million, um, but then you have an unassigned. This actually is a timing issue with the purchase of the Elks Club um, because in June, and then your capital asset rolls on the books in July of 22. And you all will see that your unassigned fund balance went up about $400,000 in the year before, largely in prior to favorable revenue over what your estimates were. Yep. Uh, the negative unassigned fund balance in the other governmental funds uh, is a direct result of the TIF. Um, you sold bonds in July, so that will be that will be funded in July, so this is as of June 30th. Um, scrolling to the next page, we just wanted to show you a yearly comparison of your fund balances. As you can see, the green color is your um, unassigned fund balance. And you have a policy that you, your goal is to have at least 15% of your budgeted expenditures. And it looks like you are budgeting and moving towards that direction. Uh, and this is the percentage of your general fund unassigned um, as it relates to your expenditures. So like we said, it's, it's going up. FY20, we have to remember, that was COVID. Like, we can't forget that. The statement of revenues, expenditures, and fund balances. So this is gonna show um, your revenues uh, at $15 million for general fund and your expenditures at 12. Um, and then you had some transfers out to different funds. So you increased your fund balance for your general fund by about $400,000 as Ron mentioned on the previous slide. I will say like capital projects, there was about a million dollars. Um, this year was a relatively easy year for y'all because you opened up the sewer, the sewer plant in FY21. Um, and so it was, it was relatively calm. <laughs> So this is just a pie chart, puts it in perspective. Um, for your revenues, about 75% um, of your revenue is through taxes. Intergovernmental um, is about 10%. That's going to be grants. And then um, charges for services, so um, your ambulance, police charges, some of those reimbursements that you have coming back. And then your expenditures, almost 50% is public safety, um, police, fire, you know. General government is the 21%. That's gonna be the city manager, finance, 
Um, and then public works is streets and fleet operations as well. This chart, we wanted to show a comparison for 2022 to 2021. Um, I would say the biggest takeaway I take is that everything's about even. Your, your revenues, 75% of it comes from your taxes. Um, public safety remains at 46 to 48%. Um, general government is about 21%. So, so nothing dramatic, nothing really changed from one year to the next. So then we get to your proprietary funds. So this is going to be your water, sewer, um, parking, and district heat. Um, what we're going to show in your fixed assets, um, like I said, it was a relatively calm year. You only put about $500,000 of infrastructure for water fund and sewer fund. The parking and the district heat remained relatively flat. And I would say just the one comment about your heat fund is it's still in a deficit situation of a little over $300,000, which is actually, I think, an improvement over last year, correct? Correct. Correct. Um, as we look at this slide, you can see your net positions, um, the water and sewer both increased. Um, water by about $400,000. Um, the sewer fund increased about $150,000. Um, your district heat... So while your overall next net position for your district heat did decrease, um, your unrestricted actually uh, improved um, about $60,000 from last year to this year. And then this shows revenues and expenses um, for your proprietary funds. And this shows the variance in the net changes. So like we said, for your water fund, you increased it about 400,000. Sewer was about 126. Um, parking, last year you actually zeroed out the fund balance and, and made it zero. And this year you actually um, improved it by $200,000 for your net position. Um, and then you can see the district heat uh, decreased your net position by $150,000. This shows the comparison of your revenues with the proprietary funds. Um, and you can see, you know, we're back up to the 2020 level. Um, 20. Uh, the difference between 21 I and the modem off and on and that seemed to have made a major difference period if you guys want to log back into your meeting I think everything's okay now so your water fees are up by about four hundred thousand dollars and then your parking revenue fees that you collected was up by about two hundred thousand dollars compared to 21 for 22 And then the expenditure side of it, you can see in 21, it was, it was high. In 22, it has decreased. Part of that is $400,000 in the sewer fund in supplies and treatment. And, um, you know, you opened up your sewer fund in 21. So that should have decreased some of your expenses in 22. And then your parking was down in the parking enforcement. So we wanted to put together a couple slides here that is actually a comparison with other entities, Barry, Shelburne, Montpelier, they're your size. And so what this is, is we're comparing their and y'all's unassigned fund balance as a percentage of budget. Um, just to see where you are compared to other towns your size. We did throw in South Burlington because right now they're also in an investment in or they're investing in their infrastructure during this time and we know that that is a discussion that you all are having especially with your proprietary funds um, so we wanted to throw south burlington in there 
Um, for fund balances, you all have a, you want a minimum of unassigned equal to at least 15%. Uh, South Burlington has, they have a minimum of one month, which is eight, about 8.33%, 8 but their target is two months, which is about 16%, which is right in line with y'all. And then we couldn't find one for Shelburne and Barry. Um, I do want to point out Barry town, you know, in 2019 and 2020, they actually had a negative unassigned fund balance. Um, you know, where y'all have actually been pretty steady and you're working to improve that to make sure you have your 15%. We always refer to in our profession as 15% as a sweet spot, 60 days, two months. And am I right that uh, from one of those previous bar charts that we're actually right at 16% right now? At 16 so right so at 16 we're actually days, right where you want to be. To the good, yeah. yeah right where you want to be. Yeah. And, and we, we put some comparisons on here, and I don't want you to think. Here's what I always say stay true to you. You know, don't compare yourself to other municipalities. You know, we talk about South Burlington or Shelburne or Barrie. You know, they have other things too. You know, between reserve accounts, conscientious funding that they put aside, some other local tax, option taxes that they all have there. Stay true to who Montpelier is though. And one of the things that I think, you know, that you'll see, you know, one of the, the, the common ground things that you'll see is infrastructure, as Miranda said. There is a lot of infrastructure investment going on in the world of government right now. Well, if you haven't seen them yet, from what is the, the Are they uh, what, so 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 last November. <coughs> Can I interrupt real quick. Um, I'm sorry. Just sorry. if you're if you have to, uh, would love to capture all this for the folks uh, at home. So make sure you're speaking into the mic. Thank you. So, did you get to ask your question? Again? Yeah. So I was asking the question if the investment in infrastructure had to do with federal dollars. Yeah. So so last November they passed a stimulus infrastructure package. It was like tagged as the Build America Back Again, and then it was tagged as the infrastructure package. That money hasn't filtered its way down into local, the money's starting now to filter its way down. I don't think we're gonna see it until 23, 24, you know, and there will be a lot of money available to government for roads and infrastructure needs. And that was the, what the whole package was designed to do. And then in our last slide, uh, we're comparing the debt um, that you have per capita, and then we compared it to these other communities. Um, so I would say Barry, Shelburne, Montpelier, you're all right at the same size, and you're right at the same level of debt compared to these other entities. Uh, South Burlington, you know, they're two and a half times your size, but they still have a larger debt per capita. Um, like we said, they, they are investing right now in their infrastructure and other, and other, they have a TIF, they have some other stuff that's going on as well with that. Um, that's the highlights. That's what folks. we got. Are there any questions? I appreciate the glance of the comparison. I mean, you gotta take it for what it is, but it's helpful, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, we, we try to, and, and I think the biggest thing that I take away from that is, is and I still maintain state of who you are. Yeah. I just want to come back to something that Jack highlighted. So, so we are meeting our fund balance policy right now. Correct. Oh my gosh. It's oh my gosh. Yeah. It's like the first time since I've been on the council for like take 10 years. Wow. Yeah, I guess so. I guess so. <laughs> well, that's that's great. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, and I want to thank Kelly and Heather and Todd for their work in the finance office. So it's always a pleasure to come here and work with them. And Super. I want to thank Miranda because I can't talk. So. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you all. All right. Thanks. Oh, uh, you may. Being that the 40 or 50, 46 to 51 percent or something was public safety, I understand that our dispatch operation brings in some $400,000. I'm wondering why that isn't managed as a proprietary fund. Why is it lumped in with police work? It's, a general, it's been a general fund. It costs about a million dollars to run. Uh, it's an offset to the dispatching. Sure. 
Proprietary funds, self-sufficient, supposed to be paid by the services they generate, and certainly public safety wouldn't even begin to hit that target for any municipality. Okay. So, thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you all. Yeah. All right. So we are on to the Wrightsville Beach Recreation District presentation, and I believe uh, we have some folks here from. Could, could just one uh, second yes, there. I yes. just want to thank. Um, finance staff, uh, certainly thank the R&R uh, uh, for their report, but also Kelly, who's been under double duty here for some time, Heather. Uh, and so I'm saying nice things about city staff, Steve, so you don't have to listen. Um, I'd like to uh, compliment uh, the finance staff, Heather, Kelly in particular has been doing double duty, Heather, uh, all of them, Tanya, Serena, I'm going to miss somebody, I'm sure, Crystal now. Uh, the folks that have worked there, th once again, we've had an un, uh, a clean audit uh, with no exceptions and no comments, and that is not the norm for municipalities. I'm sure they would tell you that. And it has been our norm for quite some time, so they put their very they take this work very seriously, and they do a really great job. Um, so thank you to all the folks in our finance. Yes, I agree. Thank you. Well done. Yeah, don't forget that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a big deal. Please pass on our, our gratitude, Kelly. Yeah. Yes. And welcome. Is it okay for us to oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Just as long as you all speak in the mic. Yes. All right. Well, I'll start. <laughs> good evening. Um, good evening, Mayor Watson. My name is Colin O'Neill. I'm the manager of the Wrightsville Beach Recreation District. Been so for about 21 years. To my right is um, John Copans. He's the, one of the two Montpelier board representatives. He was the treasurer up until recently. Um, Dan Currier, he's also a board representative and he is the current treasurer. Um, so I, I did send a handout in last week. I don't know if it was disseminated to yes. all of you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, first of all, I want to apologize because I had intended on having it be one page. <laughs> it's okay. But I got a little wordy. Now, there was, I think there was, it was, there was a lot of detail that I really wanted to get in there for you. Um, the three other towns, they did only get a one-pager, though. And um, have you all had a chance to familiarize yourself with the information here? Mm -hmm. so, um, so, yeah, we're here. Um, I'll jump right to the, to, the, to the chase here. We're here to seek an increase in the cap of the per capita that we assess all four of the district member towns. Currently, it's capped at $1.50, and we would like to increase that cap to $4. Um, it's not that we're looking to jump to actually assess $4. Our intention is to assess $2.50 for Wrightsville's 2023 fiscal year, Montpelier's 2024 fiscal year. And then, um, the plan stabilizes that assessment at 250 for a number of years. Any questions at this point? So if I understand correctly, Montpelier's portion would go from $12,000 to about $20,000? Correct. Okay. Yes, it would be an increase of about $8,074. Okay. What, what um, is the assessment on the other towns? Um, well, I don't have all of theirs here, but it's all based on their population. You know, it's all the per, per capita. So for East Montpelier, it's just under 3,000. For Middlesex, it's just under 2,000, I believe. Worcester is just over 1,000. Is the per capita rate the same for every town? Yes. Okay. So, and uh, it's, it, did I read in here that the other three towns have already agreed to raise the cap to four dollars right yeah over okay. the last month or so um, okay. i've met with the three other towns and they've all approved it so far okay and so then the intention would be to assess every town at 250 per capita correct <coughs> okay. okay any other questions uh for these folks at this point so um, thank you. I just want to um, speak to a little bit of the process um, from here. So because this is a uh, item that is usually in our budget, 
Uh, and we're going to take up uh, first run at the budget uh, this evening. Um, we're going to include this as a part of our discussion um, together with all the, the other pieces um, as a whole. Does that make sense? Sure. Okay. Does that sound okay with you all? I mean, my, my thought is that we probably wouldn't be making a decision right right now, uh, but have the decision to include it um, in, in the budget um, with, with the rest of the budget discussion. Sound okay? Okay, and I realize that means that you don't get to, you know, like, it's not done right now, um, but, uh, but I think it makes sense to do it all together. That's fine. Um, would you like me to stay for that discussion? Um, well, so there's going to be a couple of opportunities at least to uh, have input on this. So if we come up with questions uh, or objections even, or you know, actually I sort of assume that if people had questions or concerns, maybe they'd raise them now. But um, otherwise, I, I think we would have time between now and the next meeting to get in touch with you to, to ask questions if we had any. You're always welcome to stay, of course, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you don't have to. I'm getting hungry. <laughs> um, may I ask? Uh, so, yeah. uh, Dan Courier, um, the the timing for the Wrightsville budget is to try to approve it in December. So, oh. I absolutely understand oh. the council's oh. wanting to loop it into your own budget discussions. That makes sense. With our budget, because we're in a calendar year, mm. we're trying to do it a little earlier than that. But what is your time frame like? Is it January that you'll have the final approval? Uh, well, so that's that's a good uh, question. Um, so I'm jumping ahead a little bit, uh, but talking about the budget, uh, what I would like for us to do, and this is sort of a, a discussion we have to have as a council, uh, but what I would like to see us do is to, to really get into some meat of it tonight and then um, be making some decisions at our next meeting for the at the 21st. Uh, and if we can come out of the 21st with um, a budget that we're ready to take comments on, uh, then we can um, move forward with uh, the, the budget hearings in January. Uh, but then of course, you know, our, our process goes from there, you know, it has to be approved by like there are, there is still an opportunity to make changes in in January, of course, uh, and then we wouldn't know if it was approved until March. But that's um, that would be normal anyway. Like that's what we would have done, um, I suppose, in in any previous year. Um, but theoretically, we could have an answer for for our purposes um, generally by the end of December. Okay. Yes. Um, just one more comment. Yeah. So we just finished our 37th season at Wrightsville, and this is only the second time that we've come to the towns asking for an increase in that cap. We are very frugal. <laughs> <laughs> I believe it. Um, Donna, you had a question. Well, I just wanted to hear from John and Dan, who's our reps, some opinion and some influence. What would you like <laughs> us to do and why? <laughs> I mean, the letter is very factual, but I just like an assessment from you two. Yeah, we wouldn't be here, right? We, as a as a Wrightsville Beach board, certainly approve this step of approaching all the towns, and us being here is a representation that we do um, feel uh, that these, you know, as Colin alluded to, we try to be very frugal as a board. We're really proud of the resource we have at Wrightsville. It's a treasure. It gets great utilization, and this approval of this increase in the per capita, I think, really sets us on a solid footing uh, moving forward. You know, one of the quirks about Wrightsville Beach, we're we're sort of a municipality that's a gathering of, of four municipalities. We actually have no ability to take on any debt, uh, so we basically have to pay cash for everything. So all of those improvements you see out there. And that's not easy for any entity, certainly not for a municipality. So like, that explains a little bit of our, our need for some additional resources. I echo everything John said. And the other thing I'll add is, I mean, I've been off the board for a long time, just back on. It was a treat to come in and see, you know, a, a, you know, a little bit of funds in the checking account, <laughs> right? And, and, and the goal to increase, you know, the, the membership, um, and so and encourage new 
uh, new um, you know residents to come to Wrightsville because it is a jewel, right? And so, um, so yeah. Yeah, Donna, go I ahead. I buy a pass every year. I go at least once, and sometimes <laughs> dozens of times. It's just very un un. Predictable, but I have seen the improvements, and I, I do enjoy it. I'm not sure enough Montpelierites know what a treasure it is, so we need to do some enticements to get more out there. <laughs> <laughs> no, Donna, we need to keep it a secret. Everybody that uses it just needs to buy a membership. Well, it, it used to be a complete secret, um, so I've run it for 21 years. When I started, it was a complete secret, and it was a, a pit. Um, this year, we had over 17,000 user visits and counting, because people are still out there playing disc golf. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's amazing. Connor, go ahead. Disc golf hole six. Uh, that was one of the <laughs> 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 a lot of constituents asking, you know, if that's going to be moved back to the original position. <laughs> we can talk about it all. Well, that was a that was a shift we made, in prepping for COVID, um, and it ain't going back. Sorry, you got to up your game. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you. And oh, yes, Jack, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm I'm looking. <laughs> I'm looking about at the uh, revenue breakdown, um, and it looks like your uh, this past year, your, your 2022, yeah, your uh, user fees are about 60% of the budget. Uh, user fees are going down next year because you're looking to get more revenue from taxes with uh, and grants. Okay. Okay. Yep. Um, are you? Is it possible to break down uh, what the total proportion of uh, revenues is from users in all the towns? Like, can, do you know how many, you know, since Montpelier, since 75% of your users are from other towns, does that translate directly into um, how much, um, what percentage of your revenue comes from? Uh, non-residents of Montpelier? I don't have the data broken down by town where people are spending their money other than season pass purchases. Okay. And um, we do, a s the, the way that I, we come up with that 75, 25% is we do random, random sampling um, throughout the summer of just asking people what towns they're from. But, we, but when they're actually making a purchase, other than passes and they're entering their address in our in our logbook, we don't have that tracked. Okay, thanks. Because obviously we're we're Montpelier is the biggest contributor of tax revenues, but probably not the biggest pr contributor to uh, user fees. Oh yeah, by town you're definitely the largest contributor by user fee. I mean, 25% of our business comes from Montpelier, and a huge percentage comes from Barry Town, Barry City, around the state of Vermont, um, and then per capita, Middlesex is pretty comparable to Montpelier, but overall use, Montpelier is far and above every other town. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? No. Okay. All right. Well, we will. Uh, continue the discussion around uh, this item when we can take up the budget. So thank you so much, and to be continued. All right, pins and needles. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Fair enough, thanks. Thank you. Okay, so we are up to uh, discussion on the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority, and for this, I believe there's a report. Um, though I'm not sure. Am I, Don? Am I looking at you? Am I looking at? Sure. Well, you can. It doesn't. You can stay there if you'd like. Up to you. I'm, I'm speaking though from my Central Vermont Public okay. Safety Authority board hat. Okay. If I had a hat, I would have brought it. So <laughs> just in, by way of introduction, um, when we first got word of the proposed budget and, and some of the longer-term plans of CVPSA, um, I think both cities asked the CVPSA board to come to this meeting and connected with our budget process just to understand what the, the financial thinking was. Uh, and I think since then, the board's made some 
different decisions. So I think at this point, we're just seeking an update from them about where they're at. And certainly take questions afterwards. I, I, you have been notified that at last Thursday meeting, the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority Board voted to advance a plan to dissolve the Public Safety Authority. It also voted to not request any funds this March at town meeting. And it will hold its published annual meeting next Monday, December 19th at 7 p.m. remotely. And though I agree with these steps, I'm very disappointed that the cities and the surrounding towns have not committed to making a regionalized public safety service happen. In the last eight years, Public Safety Authority has really worked to increase coordination, training of dispatchers, improve the communication system. We've done studies. We have really felt we have nurtured the environment that has improved public safety in central Vermont. But understanding that and knowing maybe this is the time for this particular organization to no longer exist, I'm still very upset that the negative actions of a few, a couple actually, individuals could damage Central Vermont Public Safety Authority's reputation. That the consistent negative comments override eight years of putting good action out to support public safety. And so I really want people to know that the board itself is pleased with all the support we've gotten from the city staff, the public safety individuals, the city managers, the councils have been very accessible. We're, we're sorry that we didn't find the total buy-in that was needed to make the public safety authority really vi valid. Mm -hmm. um, but we, I do encourage this city council, as I did last night in Barrie City Council, to really look at public safety expenses and maybe the whole operation to be separate from the general budget, especially when it comes to equipment, training. I mean, we fit a niche. The public safety author services in both cities kept reducing their request on the general budget, and they didn't have money for training. They didn't have money for, to improve the, trans the communication equipment. So, you know, when public safety equipment gets right in there with, oh, we want 2% increase in tax, and that's it. It loses. And the one thing the Public Safety Authority did was take it out and look at public safety needs by itself and make it a priority. And the voters supported us every time. When we asked to do a study, they supported us. And I think they would support the cities if you could be bold enough to ask for it. Because this equipment that we have this grant coming in of two point four million right now isn't enough. It's enough to get us over the hump of the old towers and the wiring and the links. Uh, definitely other grants will bring in new radios. There's a lot of equipment that needs to be purchased. And then it needs a commitment of setting aside funds to maintain that equipment, to replace that equipment. So we never get in this big hole again. The initial need was some three, six point four. And uh, we're not asking for everything within the need assessment that's listed as equipment that we need to really service the regional area. So the 2.4 is a beginning. 2.4 million, in this case people don't know, that's an M behind it. Uh, really, it's just the tip of the iceberg. And so I really hope the city councils can commit themselves to look at public safety a little separately and perhaps put it out to the voters separately and you'll find support for it. And I'm here to answer questions. Oh, Barry, uh, City Council, to also let you know, last night, because the way it was on the agenda, they felt they couldn't do a vote, but they did a straw vote. And they are planning to bring it on the next council meeting to with put on the March ballot to withdraw from the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority. So that's the latest update that I have. Thank you. I have a couple of questions. One is, uh, so we have this $2.4 million. Uh, does the entity need to continue to exist while that money is expended? Very interesting. Uh, at the December 8th meeting when the board made the uh, motion to actually move to dissolve, there was requests coming from the Twin Cities that when they did this application with the Department of Public safety for all the new dispatch equipment. 
the state has decided to distribute all the towns they've been doing previous free dispatching on, and they have asked Barrie and Montpelier to take on more towns in their dispatch centers. And the Twin Cities, both Barrie and Montpelier, need an impact analysis before they say yes. And so the Public Safety Authority got a quest of $25,000 to do another study. Now, the study is needed, so I'm smiling because we have the money because we've asked the voters for it. And, and the cities could have the money to do these studies if you ask the voters for it. Um, so the Public Safety Authority hasn't approved that. It'll be considered at the 19th meeting. Um, but we would definitely put that money back into public safety. And once, if indeed we allow, we allot that $25,000, we will have about $5,000 that we assume, again, that it will go back to the cities and public safety in some way. Now, we are exploring with the league, who we are a member, the Vermont League of City and Towns and Legal Advice, to actually read the charter because everybody has a little different opinion of some of the language there exactly in dissolving and whether or not if indeed, like Barry puts that on the ballot, and if Montpelier decides to put it on the ballot to withdraw, and the voters agree, does it take a year or not? Mm -hmm. The charter says a year after the citizens vote, you, you can leave, but that's assuming you've got some financial buy-in, commitment, investment that needs to be dealt with. Mm -hmm. We don't have that in this case. So we may be able to uh, modify some of that. But it's to answer your question, yes. Madam Mayor, um, the application was not made by the CVPSA for the, that grant funds was made by the city of Montpelier okay. on behalf of the two cities. I'm sorry, I didn't realize you had yeah. much experience. Yeah. No, yeah. Montpelier yeah. was the, yes. Okay. Yes. Can I answer this? The no. Because the, the Public Safety Authority didn't have the capacity to take on a grant like that, and which is Montpelier stepped in to do that, gotcha. which we're very thankful for. Yep. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions, and then I know um, some folks may want to make some comments. Um, any other questions from council at this point? Okay, comments. Go ahead. Steve Whitaker, Montpelier. Um, people get crazy when there's big money in the trough. Uh, so it's important to note this money, the 2.4 million that you're referring to, the city applied for 3.6. Uh, it's not a sure thing by any stretch. It's conditioned upon meeting a governance requirement that there's a lot of wishful thinking going on. The, the city has convened, the managers and chiefs have convened this quote, you've heard Twin Cities group that's operating outside of public records open meeting law. And it is not meeting the threshold of governance of the served towns. So it may be that CVPSA is the vehicle by which we can be eligible for these funds. But even so, these funds, the 2.4 million, is only about half what the system is projected to cost. And there's no plan, there's no documents of where the other 2.4 million is going to come from or the increased operating costs. And the towns that are currently served, there's 18, 22 of them, something around there, that are currently served by Montpelier Dispatch have not been made aware or have an opportunity to weigh in on whether or not they want to sign contracts for unknown escalating rates. So this thing is a house of cards. It's been sabotaged from within the, the board. The, the interpretation of the current chair that we don't have to adhere to the charter, the charter is law. The charter says you will have an executive director, you will have an audit, you will record your meetings. The charter doesn't say that, but state law says that when they're virtual only. And all of those laws are disregarded by this chair. And in fact, I had asked for I believe you've been misled about what happened at the meeting. One of the people expi explicitly stated that he voted uh, in the affirmative specifically for the purpose of reserving the right to move to reconsider, okay? And unfortunately, due to the fact that the chair of CVPSA has refused, this is not a two-minute, one-minute thing. Uh, the 
chair refuses to record the meetings. Therefore, I have been unable to get a recording in time to provide transcripts of Jim Ward from Barry, Doug Hoyt, uh, and others that have real reservations about disbanding it, especially at this critical time where we're on the potential of accessing some substantial money from the, both the general fund and federal funds. So the problem here is that th there is no expertise. Fred Cummings moved on to wherever he went. There is no expertise in the fire service or the police of, of radio expertise. We're totally dependent upon vendors. And the, equi the analogy I would use is we wouldn't expect the meter maids to do street engineering, right? They walk, walk the streets and write tickets, but we don't expect them to do the street engineering. You don't, we don't expect the firemen, probably the highest users of water, to engineer the water mains. Here's a problem of a non-engineered multi-million dollar system that is being uh, co-opted without proper governance. And Central Vermont Public Safety Authority was formed to be that governance and unfortunately, the charter gave towns the impression that it was going to take over their services, that it was going to be one unified county scale police and fire system, and that all their individual departments would be absorbed into it. So, Stephen, you're at four minutes now. If you could wrap up your comments. Well, I, I, I can't wrap them up because there's more than that. Uh, I don't believe that the two minutes should apply here. This is an issue that you've been post kicking down the road for many meetings, and now it's reached critical. No, so this is still public comment, and the rule still applies. So if you would wrap up your comments, that'd be great. Thank you. I will, again, protest that the uh, challenge the legality of your, uh, if you really don't want to learn about the decisions you're about to make or that you're being asked to make, uh, that's typical. Thank you. Yes, go ahead. Uh, Kim Janey here. I live in Town Street, Montpelier. Um, where things stand on the grant is in the legislature, and you and you will probably have a big say in how this works out. What I would like to see is simply, we're not asking you for any money for the coming appropriation. I don't know how we're going to evolve how the governance section works out. And I don't think anybody does because the um, public safety commissioner asked for, I can't remember the number, several hundred thousand dollars to get a staff to study what kind of a plan to solve a problem they've been working on for over 50 years, which is how to allocate state and regional uh, governance and uh, she has said and it makes sense to me if local people evolve something that works for them um, we're not necessarily going to impose a cookie cutter that everybody has to fall into on the other hand the grant requirements were very specific uh, I said you had the city, in this case, would have to have contracts with 10 different entities. And the only outfit I know with those kind of contracts is uh, Shelburne. And uh, they're making it work. I don't know if they have 10. And I don't know... I don't think anybody knows how all this is going to work out. So my plea is let's wait the year out 
leave the charter in place. It'll be kind of dormant. And if that, I made some suggestions for how the charter could be amended to be a little more uh, friendly to s some of the users, et cetera. Whether they'd be acceptable or not, I don't know. Chief Pete said that they were looking at it the last time he was with a general, uh, the DPS committee that's studying this. So I would like to just see this uh, the only action I think we need is for you to uh, um, approve. You've heard the budget. The budget will come out. It'll be zero. And I should add, I don't think there's enough votes for dissolution. Um, but I don't know. I was surprised last time, so I, n I never know how they're going to come out. So I think it's kind of wait and see, and the only action that's before you, I think, is to hear the budget, and there it is, zero for <laughs> your contribution the coming year. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else in person? Justin Dreschler. Um can everybody hear me okay? That's much better. Uh, Justin Dreschler, CVPSA. I am uh, the current secretary of the CVPSA and the Montpelier rep. I am the one who moved to dissolve the CV CVPSA. It was um, it's my motion. It's been my push. Uh, if anyone is to blame, it should be me. Uh, I think that this has been a long time coming, and it took someone who doesn't care what people think of them or the consequences to actually do it. And so that's why I put it forward. Um, a couple things. Whitaker is right that uh, Jim Ward did not vote to dissolve the CVPSA. Jim Ward uh, voted in a very, very wishy-washy way. So we had a non-binding resolution to prepare a dissolution plan that we could then vote on later. So Whitaker's right about that. Doug it definitely expressed reservations, although I would, I, would, I would characterize them as like disappointment more than reservations, like disappointment with the process. Um, to me, so Kim is also right that this you have this CVPSA, somebody's got to govern something eventually, maybe, right? I guess this is, the, um, is what we have here. I just happen to think that it will never be CVPSA. Um, Montpelier itself has more or less said they're not going to work with CVPSA. Capital Fire has outright said they will never work with CVPSA. My understanding is the Barry City Council meeting last night was, um, was quite contentious. I was not there. Um, I... I find it distasteful that they were throwing around people's names as having sabotaged the CVPSA and been the real problem. This is a committee that tried very hard. Donna worked her ass off for years. You can see all the work that she's done. Kim worked his ass off for years. Whitaker has worked as hard as anybody on this thing. It's just that like, people disagree. And you don't have to say that someone ruined something. Something can just not work. And CVPSA just does not work. And, um, and I don't see any way for it to ever work without buy-in. There is no buy-in. Anyone who's ever been in a leadership position will tell you it's the only thing that actually matters is people believing in you. Nobody believes in this committee. And, um, and it's unfortunate, but it is what it is. Last thing I want to say is um, I found it very unsettling when the Capital Fire came to our most recent meeting and asked us for $25,000. This is an organization that said they're never going to work with us. Montpelier has more or less said they're not going to work with us. Barry has more or less said they're not going to work with us. I can understand why that drives Whitaker absolutely fucking nuts and why he refers to CVPSA as the piggy bank, excuse me, absolutely effing nuts. Thank you. Um, I apologize. Why Whitaker refers to CVPSA as the piggy bank for these towns, because it certainly feels like that when someone, when an organization tells you that you're no good and then they come to ask for your money because they don't have it. Um, that said, it's really important money. It's really important work. It needs to be done. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else with us in person wish to make a comment about this? Anyone else with us digitally wish to make a comment? Okay. Well, first of all, I want to just acknowledge um, all the work that's gone into this organization over the years, and I am very grateful for all the work that you have done. And 
you know, it, it seems to me that, uh, at least where, where I'm at right now, is that I, I think I, I agree with uh, the recommendation. Um, and just in terms of the process, if, if the council agrees as well, I think what we could do is um, potentially have a motion to recommend to staff to prepare some kind of language that could be approved for the ballot, um, because it would take a, a, a ballot um, item to, uh, to dissolve it uh, for our, on, our, on our part or for us to step out of it. Um, but I think we're not at the point of actually putting that language on right now, but we can ask the staff to create that language. Um, but that's just my opinion. Other thoughts? Yeah, go ahead, Lauren. Um, I, I'm in the same place. Um, one thing I would love to get and understand if, you know, assuming we move forward with this, it is dissolved. You know, clearly there was a vision and goals here. And like, what are we going to be missing out on? And if we're going to look to maintain the collaboration and, you know, maybe there's some future differently constructed iteration of this. And so, like, I would love to understand you know, what What value has there been and like what might we want to recapture in some other way or are, are there things that the cities are going to have to take on um, that CVPSA has been doing? It's not entirely clear to me like what exactly we're going to be missing by dissolving this and just like having that understanding in like a memo that then we can reflect on and look for, you know, where do we go from here, either just as a city and working in partnership with the other, you know, regional communities or do we at some point think that a different, um, you know, organizing entity is needed? And what, what would that structure be? And kind of what didn't work about this structure so that we can have lessons learned? Is that something that um, we could certainly you have. could create that? Yeah. I okay. Probably not till after we get done the budget, but we could do that. I would like to just make a couple sure. of comments, if I could, just in response to some of the comments we just heard. Number one, um, just with regard to the, the comment about funding, um, all of the funding for CVPSA comes from the city of Montpelier and the city of Barrie. They're the only two funding sources. So for those two cities to seek that money to be returned to them for a project they're working on jointly that has been supported by CVPSA, um, I'm not sure I would characterize as going to the piggy bank, I would say seeking our own money back to do a project that we've done. Um, and I, I would say that I can't speak for anybody else. I would say the city of Montpelier has not said we would not work with CVPSA. In fact, we work closely on designing this project. I would point out that the main beneficiaries of the project we're talking about are the regional towns who are non-members. So the cities of Montpelier and Barrie put a lot of work into this so that we can have better regional uh, telecommunication systems. We worked with CVPSA to create the design of the Televate study to review that uh, and have you know appreciated all they've done. We've taken advantage of the training. Uh, certainly our relationship with the city of Barrie has never been better and I think a large of that is due to CVPSA. I would say that the city has been clear that at least as currently uh, constituted and with what is available that we were not interested in consolidating services or giving up our services to another entity until we felt confident that our residents would have the same or improved services. So I just want to be clear, the city isn't, this city at least has never said we're going to take our ball home. Uh, when this was first formed, when it was first being talked about being formed, Mayor Hooper, Mayor Holler, Mayor Watson all said, we're interested in this, but not just to save money, we want if we're not getting better service out of this, we're not interested. And that's always been the guiding principle from the city. So I think we appreciate the work. Um, and uh, I, I agree with Mr. Drexler, Dreschler that I'm not sure there is a huge amount of confidence for whatever reason, right or wrong, deserved or not. Um, and uh, and I'd be happy to, we can have, certainly have an agenda item in the future about this grant process, the project, who's involved, the conversations that have been held with the neighboring towns about what they're getting into, and the agreements that are being made on that. But that is another, so I think it's up to you what you want to do with the authority itself. I just want to make clear that um, many people have spoken truths tonight, and that's great. Uh, 
the money came from the cities. They wanted it back. The cities have put themselves out to serve the entire region as well as CVPCSA. Other comments from the council? Yes, go ahead. There was a, a, several interesting questions out of the Barry City Council, and one sort of relates to Lawrence, and, and that is the cities weren't ready to succeed any authority. They weren't ready to appoint their own public safety staff to the board, which was the expectation. So they always stayed a little back. And I think with the state now putting out a grant and the attitude of regional dispatch centers, the cities will get guidance and you'll, you'll develop a format that works because it is in the future. Vermont is going to statewide regional systems. So I really think it's a waste of time to spend any more on why we failed. You know, we achieved some things. It wasn't what we aimed, but that often happens. But we did achieve some things. So I think the public safety is ahead. I wouldn't, I wouldn't spend the time, Lauren. <laughs> is there a motion? Um, hold on a second. I'd like to see if there is a motion. Yes, Jack. I move that we direct city staff to uh, produce uh, a resolution that we can go to the voters to uh, exit or dissolve the authority. Thank you. Second. Okay, so a motion and a second. Uh, further discussion and. Um, anything anything more. Okay. Uh, in that case, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. And opposed? All right. Should I abstain? I don't think you need to. Okay. Aye. Okay. Uh, all right. And uh, just to check again, any opposed? Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, and uh, gosh, please pass along our, our gratitude to, uh, to everyone on the committee. Um, and yes. Boyd isn't here. But he's been on. He's with us digitally. No, I, I'm sorry. I didn't yeah. see him there uh, since 2014, and it needs to be. Uh, he applied a lot of past experience. Very, very helpful member of the board. Yes. Thank you. Okay. All right. So we are going to move on to the. Oh yeah, it is 8.30. Okay, so yeah, we are going to take a 10 minute break. It is 8.28 right now. Um, we're gonna say we'll be back at 8.40, which is actually 12 minutes. Okay, thanks. Okay, so it is 8.40, we're gonna come back from our break. Uh, one of the things that we neglected to do was accept the report of the audit is there a motion to do that? Yes. I make a motion that we accept the audit that was presented. Okay, okay motion and a second. Further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. And opposed? Okay. All right, and so I think we're ready to discuss the budget. Okay, thank you, okay. Madam Mayor, members of the City Council. Um, go tonight, you've received uh, the line by line detail of the budget. I believe we're going to be getting the budget book. Um, okay, how's that? Is that better? I don't know. How's that? Is that right? No, it's too fuzzy. How's that? Perfect. We like perfect. Okay. Um, so, Thank you uh, for the opportunity to present the budget. The goal tonight, so what was I saying? You've received the, the budget overview letter, which kind of describes what's really in the nuts and bolts of the budget. You've received the actual line by line detail of the entire budget. Um, we, you should be getting the budget book by the end of the week, which just has more graphs and those types of things that's being completed. Um, new this year, uh, between now and your meeting next week, we will be we're doing uh, individual videos of each department. Uh, department will be making a presentation uh, as if they were sitting here, just going through the key aspects of their budget. Those will be on video, hopefully by the end of this week. 
uh, up on YouTube for all of you to see as well as members of the public and that way um, next week you could just ask questions if you chose instead of having to hear the whole presentation here so that's that's still coming um, this presentation tonight is really meant to uh, provide a high-level overview of the budget. We've got key staff here if you have questions about any aspects of it. I know the mayor had indicated she wanted to get into some meat of it. I think obviously from from our perspective with staff, the, f the biggest question is, is the overall level of the budget where you want it? Uh, would you like to see more or less, et cetera? Um, because that will define what we do over the next week. And then, um, and then obviously, how you move things around within it if you choose to. So as we prepared the budget, we talked about this a little bit earlier, our goal is always to implement the strategic plan that we spend a lot of time on. We have uh, talked a lot about our staffing. We are getting there. Most of our departments now are uh, getting near full with the exception of the police department, although they are making some strides. They're not as, less, not as unfull as they were. Uh, is to continue our investment in infrastructure, to deliver responsible f services, and stay within the 7.7% inflation rate, which is what it was when we started this process. We did get new information that it's now at 7.1%, so just so people are aware of that. Um, uh, so going through our strategic plan, just trying to hit some of the key elements of the budget for you to see, uh, in the improved community c prosperity, we uh, increase the economic development funding from $50,000 to $100,000 with the idea that it would be entirely earmarked for the Country Club Road Project. We need the money for that project anyway, but we felt long run this would then restore the funding for economic development going forward. We retain the $45,000 for the Homelessness Task Force. We've got the $134,150 for the Community Fund, which was last year's amount. 32,600 for the Montpelier Alive and 10,000 for the um, Montpelier Arts Fund, Community Arts Fund. Uh, under our provide local uh, responsible and engaged government, uh, we're gonna we'll talk a little bit this more about this more under ARPA, and Kelly can give you some more detail. But given the constant struggles we've had with microphone sound, et cetera, we've gotten some pricing to uh, upgrade this room, and uh, we can do that actually relatively quickly we're going to propose to actually to use some ARPA money for that uh, it's been a constant battle and to try to modernize this room recognizing we're going to be doing probably hybrid meetings and the like um, from now on and to uh, approve that we have AD the ADA transition plan projects which for this year is largely the elevator in the City Hall we put money in last year we've got funds in this year we are budgeted for fully staffed city departments including the new position you improved last year on sustainability and taking our part-time communications coordinator position to full-time. Uh, we've kept the 20000 in for the committee stipend program, $10,000 for social and economic justice uh, advisory committee, and $15,000 for legislative advocacy. Those were all new le in the last year or so and were at uh, sort of initiatives of the council. We kept those in. Create more housing. We put in 110,000 for the housing trust fund with the idea that it would all, again all be earmarked for the Country Club Road project, uh, and I'll be talking about more of that a little bit later tonight. But uh, we are, you should be receiving a written update on that project uh, soon, and um, I'm going to mention this under my manager's report. But so you have time to think about it. Uh, we had, we had suggested that maybe January 18 might be a budget workshop night. They've asked that we instead, if you're not still working on the budget, that we have a workshop night on the CCR project, so that you can see the early drafts uh, and then and get a handle on their initial findings. Um, so that is moving along with the idea that maybe within the time frame that had been laid out, the council would be approving and the community would be approving sort of the vision for this project. Uh, practice good environmental pr purchase. Uh, stewardship we are looking at uh, some of our first truck purchases electric boa purchase uh, you've heard from Chris Lumbra about some of the actions so we are looking at com converting the DPW complex to renewable uh, and that will require reworking the bond language last year's bond language uh, talked about a, s a series of project and specifically mentioned pellet burner so if we want to have more uh, options such as uh, using the methane heat those kinds of things we need to rework the, the um, burner 
uh, excuse me, the, the ballot language. So we'll be coming forth with a proposal on that. Uh, capital needs assessment. This is a longer term, taking a look at all of our, uh, doing an assessment of all of our projects, of all of our uh, capital assets, excuse me, to determine where we need to make the improvements for sustainability. Uh, we're continuing the funding for My Ride. Confluence Park is another you heard from a resident today. The price keeps going up for that, so I think uh, the plan for that is to continue to finish the design work, have it come to the City Council with the updated design and the updated cost estimates, and then you would make a decision whether to delay, to cancel the project, what you want to do. Um, but also that is uh, the $600,000 that was included in that larger bond. Um, when we think about reworking that bond, we might want to have some flexibility for that as well. That could, because if you chose not to go forward with it, it could con conceivably be reallocated to housing resources or uh, completely redoing the DPW campus to make it net zero. There are a number of things. We certainly have no shortage of capital and community needs that that could be reallocated to. And lastly, we are pr proposing the stormwater utility that you've heard about. That will also require a charter change. Uh, you'll probably hear more about that next week uh, with some draft language, um, but um, that's coming. To build and maintain sustainable infrastructure, we've maintained the total $2.149 million capital plan funding that was we had last year. We met with the capital committee and an extra uh, earlier today, and our goal really had been to get that number to 2.4 million this year, or at least something between 2.15 and 2.4, uh, but given the constraints of trying to stay even at 7.7% or actually at 7.4 where we ended up, uh, that seemed very uh, difficult. We still have ARPA funding, which we'll talk about. The rec center uh, is a huge need, and that's where we're doing the future planning at the Country Club Road. Reminder that even though these were all approved last year, we will be doing this work in the coming year, $7.2 million uh, starting on East State Street. That will actually be for a couple of years. The Barry Main intersection will be getting done. The street light improvements, these are all funds we approved last year, but it's still work. In addition, uh, there's a, a, a CSO project on State Street that will be done, which will result in you know paving after that. And the state is paving Route 2. Uh, all the length of it from the creamy stand to the wayside. Uh, so while that is not our project per se, that is a huge investment in new paving in the center of the community. So there will be a lot of work done even, uh, although not as much as we would like probably. Uh, improve health and safety. We will continue uh, funding for the body-worn cameras, which started in FY23. Uh, and I'm sure the police department can explain this better than I can, but we are putting in a new uh, policy management platform for the police. This is an uh, um, an increase, a, a new initiative. We are supporting a canine unit. Uh, our dog Atlas just came out of training. I met him tonight, and uh, he will be out. He is a very uh, young working dog uh, and will be carefully managed, but is, is right now is specifically on tracking uh, lost items and people and those kinds of things. Um, and again, Chief can explain more about that. And we've done a lot of work on planning of the crisis inter intervention team program, and this would be moving forward toward implementation of that. So taking a look at the capital improvements plan, um, you can see our total funding at the bottom in FY23 was 2.149165, and that's what's proposed for FY24. That's the good news. Uh, and then in FY25, you see 2.4 million. That's where we had hoped to be. That had been the level we were at pre-pandemic, and we're trying to get back to that. The bad news is because of the debt we've taken on uh, over the last year, uh, you can see that the debt went from 716 in FY23 to one point, I mean, almost double. Uh, not quite, in, in FY24, dropping the annual amount from what, a little over a million to just $640,000. So that's really what results in, in less work this year being done. But remember, those debt payments reflect all those big projects we just talked about. So we are, money this year is being invested into infrastructure. It's just not as what we call pay-as-you-go or annual money. It's in debt money. Um, our goal, as you can see, is to get you know, next year to be at 2.4 million and then to slowly uh, continue to build that up on an annual basis so that we can keep track and, and hit the so-called st steady state. 
Uh, I'm not going to go into this in great detail, but you can just see uh, really the different programs that are going in. The biggest project is the Grout Road Bridge, which has been in planning for a while. We had 330000 in last year's budget. We've got 200000 in. We received a, a, a $175,000 grant. This is a bridge that is failing. You can't put a fire truck across it. Uh, that Those particular homes are on wells. You can't get a well dr drilling rig across it. It's uh, And it's been f failed now for a few years. It's time that we, we need to do that. Uh, the sidewalks, those are our match for that Route 2 paving project, upgrade sidewalks and do things along the way. Um, and IT, again, these are uh, things that we need to do. Buildings and ground, as I mentioned, the $100,000 for the elevator. And so you see the big thing is the drop. Last year we did, uh, excuse me, we had a huge amount, $875,000, which would be our goal to pave each year and certainly have a lot less uh, funding for paving next year. Again, recognizing that we have um, a lot of work that was will be done, and we did over a million dollars worth of work this year, uh, so we are a little bit ahead of the game. And I'll talk a little bit more about other potential funding sources for that. Uh, and just in equipment, again, um, you can see this here. We don't need to go through this in detail unless you have questions for the appropriate department head about these. Uh, one of the, the these. Both of the equipment and the capital plans do have multi-years to them. I think just a reminder that you've heard before, the biggest ticket item coming in the future is a new ladder truck, uh, which is $1.2 million. Um, it will be eligible for grant funding in another year or so, which is why we've been putting it off. Um, but that will be a large, again, bond purchase that we would make, which would impact this fund, uh, but it is not included in this year. Uh, just taking a look at our... Uh, ARPA. So as you so you can see, we had $2.2 million. The column on the left is w where we have allocated that funding. So you can see it's pretty much all allocated except for 36.83. And you can see the $50,000 for the upgrade to this room and $20,000 for district heat connections. Those are things we are proposing this year. Uh, those would be to help individual people connect to district heat, uh, which would um, help. Everything else is things that you've already allocated, and to the right is just what we've actually spent so far in each of them. So um, they're still f unspent funds, but they are in, ca you know, they are in certain categories. So again, you can see there's still $300,000 in road and bridge work left to go. Uh, there's still some equipment purchases left to go. So while our capital plan isn't what we would hope, um, some of this work is still being done through ARPA. Uh, and we still have the big ticket item of $425,000 for uh, awaiting the, the, um, the, con the, the report from the Homelessness Task Force. Uh, I would add that uh, we did take a look at using some of this funds for uh, public restrooms. You heard the demand for that. There's no question about that. And um, just to respond to some of the comments that were made, I have withheld creating any initiative uh, administrative initiative on that, waiting to hear what the recommendation of this, if, if there's a if there's a use for this 425,000 that is other than public restrooms that would meet a need for unhoused people, then I want to make sure that gets fully vetted rather than we somehow grab this money, build restrooms, and then we don't have enough to deal with that population. So I, could we advance this faster than the committee? I think so, but I also think we need to hear all the options on the table before we get to that. Oops, oh, that was, oh, what am I doing? something. Uh, so we did have two surveys this year. Uh, we had a sort of an informal, unscientific budget survey, which I forwarded to you. They only had three or four questions. Uh, so 99% Montpelier residents responded with 268 responses. Uh, the top answers were not surprisingly infrastructure, public works, public safety, and housing. Uh, there was uh, certainly uh, 52% did not support tax increases, but, uh, you know, 48% were either yes or undecided. So uh, clearly we got a message there, but um, we have to balance that, of course, of what you know. And then um, you heard then again, 44% felt some departments should be reduced and some supported our budget, some didn't know, some thought there should be some increase. Uh, so again, that was a, a, an unscientific snapshot, but still a valuable uh, piece of input. We probably won't get 268 people coming to these meetings, so uh, it's a way to hear from people. 
uh, similarly, we had a complete uh, national citizen survey conducted. Uh, we did get 700 and some odd responses. That was uh, was st uh, statistically significant, and all those results you've seen, they're all on the website, and they are. There's also tabs by income, age, homeowner, any number of demographics. So it's a very interesting work, and. Um, they also ranked the the services in order and we can certainly do more on the survey but didn't want to take up too much time in this meeting but just note that we we have had surveys we are publishing them and putting them out so bringing this all in uh, when you take a look at where the city budget is net of revenues and everything else including the ballot items that you have already approved um, we are at about a 7.4 percent increase so we were, we're proud of ourselves for coming in under 7.7 but now we're over 7.1 so uh, there's that uh, obviously there's a list of items that were requested not just capital uh, that are in the package that we did not we're not able to fund and now we have an additional 8,000 requests from Wrightsville tonight so obviously those will be the kinds of things that for you all to discuss uh, water and sewer rates we are uh, budgeting for this and again we're going to talk a little bit later Kurt is going to give you an update on those and what kind of money we're putting in those budgets for uh, capital improvements but as per policy from the council we are proposing one percent over inflation again we may need to ad uh, adjust the uh, the 8.7 to 8.1 but that is following the council's policy so that we can set money aside for infrastructure improvements so at this point, we can take questions. I can take questions. There are specific questions. We have several department heads present. We are planning to talk about this next week. We had set aside the fourth if needed for budget workshop. Mayor says we're going to be done next week, so I believe her. Uh, public hearings will be held on uh, January 11th and the 26th. And just remind everybody, the 26th is a Thursday. That's the night for final adoption and inclusion of any of these ballot items. Um, uh, including these, the potential ballot item on CBPSA, potential ballot items reworking bonds, and of course uh, there's a separate time change timeline for charter changes, but they would also have to be included at that point. We will have the interactive spreadsheet on the website and here for council meeting, so that as you make decisions, we can see how that works. And that's really the high level presentation on the budget. Like I said, we can get as into the weeds as you'd like or um, as high above the clouds as you'd like on this conversation. So that's all I have. Um, and I'll move back up there and we'll start taking questions unless there's anything in here you'd like me to go back to to um, review. No? All right then. Uh, I'll stop my share. I think that was the right thing to do. Uh, well, no. so, f oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, I'm just gonna move back to this. Okay. Well, first of all, just thank you, and please pass on um, my gratitude to all the um, staff to, that uh, helped put this together. <laughs> uh, so, one of the key questions is, are we at the, generally the right level? Um, and then if we wanna get into any further detail, we certainly can. Um, so thoughts about any of those things, comments in general? Go ahead. Just a question first. Do we have any information yet from the school district on just like the overall impact to voters? So we don't have anything um, official. What we, Kelly, would you like to answer that question? No, I mean, you were the one that saw it, so I'd rather have you give more accurate information. Um, so Bill's probably, this is what he was gonna say, um, I hope, <laughs> is, is that we, we do have information from the school. Um, their budget is, is down. Um, they're actually projecting a decrease right now at this point, but they're still in deliberation, so we don't know what the actual impact will be yet. Um, and I do have a question out or a conversation, request for a conversation with the business manager. Um, she did get back to me, but I didn't have the chance to connect. Um, so hopefully in advance of the meeting um, next week, I'll have more information. Um, and hopefully we can kind of run the rough calculations of you know where they're at right now currently. Um, I'm just not sure where they'll end up. And so I'm a little hesitant to kind of give any information at this point because um, 
it certainly is favorable. I will say that. Uh, Connor. Yeah, so for the jumping ahead a wee bit, but local options on the ballot, it passes. Uh, 1.65 million in revenue. What does that bring the 7.4 down to? So um, if that were to put it on the ballot and to pass, we, you know, at this point, we can't assume any of that revenue because we don't know, first of all, whether or not you're going to put it on the ballot, and we don't know if it's going to pass. We don't know for sure if the legislature will pass it once we've passed it, although they certainly seem to be doing so routinely now. Our experience with the rooms, meals, and alcohol tax was that it took them about half a year to get it up and running before we started seeing money. So the well, it's not insignificant. The most we would see would be about half of that revenue in this year. So um, I was going to mention that when we got to this, but that might be a place where we could then backfill some of the capital needs that we had um, hoped to. You know, it would be kind of a, a budget windfall or some of these other projects, whether it's for homelessness or bathrooms or those kinds of things. But I recall when, and you may you you also may have the discussion when we talk about that item if you choose to go ahead to put it on the ballot being dedicated for certain uses uh, i know last time it was dedicated for economic development and and um and infrastructures and that's you know what we've been technically using it for um so i think those are all all possibilities what happened when we did do i think mayor watson and council member bate will remember when when we did finally get the projected, we brought it to the council and then they actually appropriated the money at that time for half a year of what they were going to use it for. So sometime, you know, at this time next year, we'd be sitting here saying, okay, it looks like it's, you know, we're gonna start collecting. Where do you wanna use it? So I don't think we should count any of it for this year. I think in the future, you know, it could just be used as revenue and tax reduction. I mean, there's any number of things you can use it for, so. But I, I can tell you if I look quickly, to answer the question you actually asked. <laughs> <laughs> it would represent, let me just see here, if I put it in cents or percentages. I think I put it in percentages. So it would be about 15% um, tax reduction. So if we just took it and reduced the taxes by it. Uh, Jack? I'm happy to start out. Uh, I, uh, you know, every year, Mayor, you send the survey to all the council members, and you, one of the questions you always ask is, well, what's your target for, uh, for a budget? What's our percentage or whatever? And I, my answer is always the same. I don't really know what my target is because what my really t real target is, is how are we, what are the services we need to provide to the residents, and how can we, afford to provide them and, and make it work. And where I come come out here is that we don't have any services that, that we're providing to the city that we don't need to be providing. And so I, I, I think we need, what we hear from people is that, you know, one thing we hear a lot from people is they're, uh, they've got real issues with uh, some of the public infrastructure, the roads, the uh, water system in particular, and uh, and so we need to keep maintaining our investments in those services, and I think the same is true for everything we do. I think that uh, although it's a hard year because inflation is high, we can't say, well, we're just gonna disregard the fact of inf inflation and we're not going to, uh, because that's really gonna re result in cuts in the services that people rely on. So I, just as a big picture uh, view of the proposal, I it, it looks good to me. I think we're hitting the target w where we should be. I don't wanna respond to that specifically. There's something I just forgot to mention in my pr presentation, which I meant to mention is that it does have to do with inflation. Um, as you know, this past year, we've struggled mightily with vacancies in our positions and inability to fill key positions. And also, as you know, we've come to you uh, 
with uh, uh, necessary uh, adjustments in, in personnel costs to attract employees. And that's fully reflected in this budget. So that is one of the things that puts pressure on the other aspects like capital. Those are, you know, not just to sort of trade one versus the other, but this is now fully in this budget. So um, the, the, the changes we had to make to the police contract, public works contract to stabilize, um, you know, this is part of the cost, not only the, the, the inflationary cost in our budget, but then the restraints on the other choices. And, you know, obviously at the time we didn't know exactly what those trade-offs would be, but we did know we were going to have to face trade-offs and you all understood, you know, we all understood that. So just want, meant to say that in my presentation, but thank you for reminding me. Yeah, go ahead, Gary. Um, yeah, just to kind of echo what Jack had said, I think, um, you know, I don't have a, a target either because I think we need to look at what do we actually need to do, what services do we need to provide, and then we have to figure out how to pay for that. Um, at the same time, um, recognizing that we're all dealing with inflation, um, setting a target for an increase that is above inflation um, it is as uncomfortable for me to be defending to, to folks in Montpelier. Um, with, with the inflation being as high as it is and we're all paying, all of us are paying so much extra for everything. So um, I don't have any, any thoughts about how to change that um, yet. I will be looking more carefully at it and I'm excited about the spreadsheet where I can play around with different things. But um, uh, I don't want to cut services and if there are other ways to find revenue other than property taxes, which I know we're going to be talking about a little bit later, um, that would be great. But, you know, I know we're sort of locked in here. But so that's just where I'm coming from. Good. Uh, do you mind if we go over the Confluence Park uh, numbers again there, just for what we'd be on the hook for for this year. Um, and I, I, I'm asking just because, um, you know, I think somebody had a comment, um, and I, I think I would agree to some extent we significant work could displace some of the unhoused who are currently sort of residing there, and I would worry about that and whether that might be actually an impediment to, to move forward with some of these plans. So I, um, I don't really have a professional opinion about that, but certainly as far as the um, numbers are concerned, you know, the, the original thought was this project was going to be an approximately half a million dollar project, and then we got estimates at about 1 to 1.2. So uh, a grant was received, for, and I, I oh, Alec is here, so you can bail me out if I get this wrong, but the grant was received for about five or $600,000. We put in essentially the match. Last year, the bond, we included $600,000 for the city's match, thinking that was the combination of the two would be sufficient to do this project. Um, I haven't seen all the details, so I can't speak that intelligently about it, but um, wasn't that long ago we got word that those costs were going to be close to $2 million instead of, you know, 1.2. And I know for me at least that caused me a little bit of pause. This isn't a large piece of land, and it's a pretty sizable, you know, for, you know, cost. And then more recently, we got costs, very recently, within the last week or so, that those numbers could be approaching $3 million. And so we had a conversation internally about, um, you know, what should we do, um, given that this has been a council priority. So our conclusion, to recommend to you and to talk about tonight and next week, is that we would, the design is almost done, we're doing internal technical review on it, that we would bring the design to the council so people could see it, see the uh, estimate, estimates and then decide whether you wanted to go forward, whether you wanted to just hold the design and delay, uh, try to find you know, what you wanted to do with it. So that's where that particular project stands. Um, your choices with regard to the 600,000 is, you know, obviously if you were going to, so number one, if we chose not to do the project, we could just not let the debt. And that just so we had a 1.8 million dollar bond, we'd only issue 1.2 million of it, and we'd never have to pay the debt on it, and we could go back and ask for the funds for something else, or we could rework, you know. And I think what Will going to suggest is that we we have to put 
a bond amendment language on for that particular article anyway because of the pellet stove. So why not also put something that gives us the flexibility to reallocate that money if we choose to so we don't then have to have a subsequent vote. Um, so then the council could choose, again, you could always choose not to let the money or you could choose to then reallocate it to some other bond worthy project. And I say bond worthy because we will always recommend against bonding for paving. So while it's easy to say, oh, there's 600,000 for paving, um, that's not a good use of debt service. So, um, but there are many other projects for which it could be a good use. So th that's kind of where we stand right now. But, um, you know, un until you say anything, it's still an active project that we are uh, pursuing and that we will bring to you for your consideration when it's ready for prime time. It does seem to like um, we need to make some kind of decision about that soon, but it, it also seems like th um, do we need to make a decision about that together with this budget? I think the o so my own opinion is that the only th decision you need to make is if you want to sort of just rework that ballot item and uh, to make it more flexible. So then you then assuming we do that and assuming it passes, then you can s decide the fate of the project whenever you're ready to hear about it and what you want to do about it. And you know maybe that includes asking them how do you get it back down to the number that we want it. You know I mean I I think there's you know I don't think you have to do anything. I know Mike looks like maybe he's wanting to speak more to that. So I will happily stop talking. Hi, Mike Miller, Planning Director. So I just wanted to clarify that what we have right now is a grant to develop the plans. So there is a grant, there's already money for developing the plans. That's the project we're completing that what the de designers need going forward is a review from the staff, that's the technical review, and then a presentation to council so they can finish their grant, which is the project design. Obviously, we always designed this project with the intention of moving it forward. So there's going to kind of be one step, which is what do you think of the design? What are your comments? And then there may be immediately thereafter a process that is, but we're probably not going to move it forward or we're going to hold it. Um, there's been some interest. You'll get a presentation from uh, the River Conservancy. They would like a year, hold the bond open for a year so we could go and do the fundraising. Um, they will make that presentation to you um, in January when we meet. So um, just so you understand, there are two separate pieces. One is to complete the design. That's what these folks are getting paid to do. That's what they're working on. They put together the budget estimates to go along with it that have been escalating. So you'll certainly have opportunities to ask them about why the costs are where they are and what we might be able to remove to reduce prices, those types of questions. But there is one piece of design and one piece of what do we do afterwards <laughs> yes Jeff. And, and then Don and this money we got this grant we got for the design is money that we own now and we would not have to give it back if we get the design and then don't go forward to construct the project no we don't have to repay it Good to know. Thank All you. right. And so for the public who couldn't hear Alec, he said it, that the city could be on the hook for 150000 if we didn't move forward. Okay. Donna. I have a question too, Mike. When you mentioned the wording, you indicated l develop the land. Is it specifically at Confluence Park? Was the bond in such that it could be any park? Bill, Bill knows the bonding language better than I do. I'd have to look at it. I think it ref I, I'd have to look at it. If someone has an annual report, we can answer that question really quickly. But um, yeah, I, I just, yeah. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Yes, Don. I too, and I'm glad to see others who aren't looking for a certain percentage. Mm -hmm. In the past, I um, was a little bit of a minority there. Mm -hmm. But I also feel like that whatever the inflation rate is at the moment changes. 
and it had been 7.7, and now it's 7.1, and who knows what it is by the time of town meeting. But generally, we know <laughs> that where we are now is in the general field. We're not way out. So I feel very comfortable with that, and maybe even a little higher if we find some essential need that we want to increase, like capital. Um, so I, I'm generally okay. So on that, I'm, I'm going to dig a little deeper because um, on, on the questions of like what what are the services that maybe we've left out, um, I have some questions. Um, so in the message that's attached to the agenda, um, there's some there's a list of items that are not included, and some of those I'm fine with. Some of those I have questions about. Um, so this does not include the Parks Commission request. That's something that's on my radar of something that I I would like us to consider. Um, putting that in. I'd, I'd, anyway, I'm looking forward to getting the spreadsheet so I can play with, you know, like how much does that actually affect it. Same with the $8,000 request uh, increase uh, for the uh, Wrightsville uh, Reservoir District. Um, and then, so that would, I assume, also be on this list of things that are currently not included. Yes? Is that correct, Bill? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, no, no, it's okay. Um, we may want to also consider the Conservation Commission uh, request. I, I don't know what the Parks Urban Ranger position is. Um, wondering if anyone has some information about that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, Alec Ellsworth, Parks Director. Uh, the Urban Ranger position was um, created sort of in tandem with Confluence Park, recognizing that um, we have maintenance needs specifically around the recreation path. Um, and with Confluence Park coming on board, as we thought in the next year, it was a seasonal position to sort of take on a bunch of under um, maintained uh, items such as the rec path, um, Montpelier Live was gonna throw in some money for watering flowers and things like that. And because Confluence Park, it seemed, whatever happened, whatever you all decide with it, it's clearly not gonna get constructed in the next budget year. So we just took the Urban Ranger position off okay. um, in the sense that it felt like a an easy scratch. Okay, Yeah. great, thank you. Um, could, uh, sorry, did you have questions? Maybe it was gonna say the same thing you were gonna say, which is, might be useful to just go through the whole list of things that aren't included to. Yeah, well, so I would like to know about the Washington County Mental Health Social Worker. Um, I'd like to know a little bit more about the trash contract that's listed here, and then the police uh, subscription to the LexisNexis and radio backup. Um, so why don't, uh, I'll try to get people up here that in a grouping. I'd also point out that um, you know, when you hear, so just yep. when you hear the budget presentations from each department, mm -hmm. there may be additional items that weren't included right. too. So this is, right. these are big, th but just to be clear, to, so yeah. that there are more than that. But uh, maybe Chief Pete could explain the uh, Washington County Mental Health and the police subscription. No, just Chief Pete. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, for Washington County, we, uh, hopefully work, uh, sorry about that, uh, for Eric Nordenson from the police department, uh, for the Washington County part, we have not been able to fill the position for the last year plus. Um, we're having some revisitation of what we actually want and need. Um, so we're talking about possibly having a screener and looking for funding through Washington County Mental Health for that. So that was kind of a, a a cut that hurt, but it also didn't cost us a plow driver or a police officer. So it was one that we took. Um, and then the new initiatives that we had were Lexus Nessus to basically have a dashboard for people to do online reporting to us. And it was just something that, again, we, we didn't feel good about taking new initiatives when, you know, we're making tough decisions on pavement and things like that. And then the radios uh, were like a secondary radio for us where we can communicate on our radio through our cell phones. So if we were in a unique area where our radios maybe didn't work, our cell phones could then double as our radios. And it was a, it was a small amount, but again, when, when everybody's sacrificing a little bit, you, you don't take anything new. So those are our three things that we looked at that we just didn't think we 
should put in there. Um, I guess I would be curious as to, so those are two separate things, um, the Lexus Nexus, Nexus and then the radio backup? Correct. Right, so um, I would be curious as to what the radio backup um, would cost. That so was, I believe it was $5,000. $5, okay. Yep. okay, great, thank you. Sure. And then, Kurt, did, I, I believe, well, Kurt, do you want to talk about the trash contract? <clears throat> Sorry, thank you, team, for letting me ask all these questions. <laughs> Yeah, the spread the uh, interactive spreadsheet is coming, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This is okay. they're just going. I think you're just going off the letter, right? Yeah, I'm going off the letter right now. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, thank you. Okay. Uh, Kurt Modica, Public Works Director. Uh, so the cur we've gotten a lot of complaints about um, the trash pickup and the trash barrels overflowing in the downtown. So we had proposed initially in the budget to increase um, the frequency of the pickup. Right now it's two days a week. We had looked at going to three days a week. Um, you know, again, like uh, uh, Eric Norton said, uh, Nordenson said from PD, where you know we looked to cuts. Um, so we we took that out, but we do have a, a backup plan in uh, proposing an amendment to our union contract and having DPW staff um, make that extra pickup with some financial incentive in the union contract. It's a little bit of an unknown, but that was the approach we we're going to take to uh, resolve that issue. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> um, I have one other question about um, one of the things that was in your presentation, <clears throat> excuse me, which is, uh, so in the upgrades to this room, um, I mean, you mentioned uh, the microphones, that, so that basically like the electrical system. Uh, I am, one of the things that's just been on my radar for this room that should happen is that this horseshoe should not be elevated um, for ADA purposes. Um, so is that, that's not, I assume that's not a part of the upgrades, but it, it would be great it if it would be. strictly technological, but it is something we could, uh, well, should, that would be a separate thing. That would but be yes. a separate thing. We could put a ramp. We could put somewhere. a ramp. That's true. It, being able to be seen from when you're in the audience yeah. doesn't work unless you're a little elevated. Yeah, that's fair. Well, that's yeah. all. I feel like Kelly, a do you want to try to describe the proposal we've got or? It's okay. It's okay, not that not that right. urgent right now. I mostly was just wondering if you know, since we were talking about this room, you know, um, what was included there. Um, okay. Any other questions that folks have? Thoughts, comments. Okay. Do you do you feel like you have enough information to? I mean, I guess the question is, it sounds like. People aren't looking to make, you know, if, if you want us to move to try to get to 7.1 before next week or you just want to leave it where it is and see where you end up or I, I, we're, you know. What I'm hearing is that it sounds like we're, we should leave it where it is for now and, and we'll have more discussion in the future, the next meeting. Yes, Carrie. Yeah, I'm fine with that. I think um, if we, I might be interested in in suggestions for getting it down a little bit, but I think that you all have done your part and <laughs> come to us with, you know, you, I know you've done a lot of work at getting it to where you want it to be. And so um, I think now it's a, a little bit more in our court to look at it and make some suggestions or decisions. Well, so we appreciate that, but of course, where we want it to be is where you want it to be. So uh, we're happy to, you know, we're happy to work on that and I think would we think the difference between the 0.03 percent was like thirty thousand dollars or something? So that's if you were, that's what you'd be looking for. To so it just becomes a priority question, and and obviously if if you wanted to put more into capital, then then it, the rest has to come up. You know, assuming it's not going any higher than where it is now. I mean, I think that if, there, if there's a well, yeah, I don't know. Maybe you'll act, add more. I don't want to make that assumption. You all have done stranger things in the past. <laughs> yeah, I mean, oh, yes, Lauren, go ahead. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, overall, I echo what others have said. I think the approach of, you know, let's fund what we need to fund for the essential services. I think a time of hardship with high inflation is not a time to be cutting services to the community. And I 
pretty much every day hear something about people wanting, you know, improvements to the roads or things that's not looking for cutting services. I pretty much never hear. So I think we're on the right track. I mean, one thing that I brought up in the capital improvement conversation earlier, um, but just to name, I mean, I think as we look at it, I mean, I just have my eye on that massive pile of federal funds and I know we're still waiting on guidance and what that could be but in terms of like the city needs and upcoming projects and the things that seem to be eligible you know because there's a lot of money for roads bridges EV charging like there's there are buckets that we know and so you know being able to look at how do we take full advantage and keep you know our eye on the priorities and the direction that we want to go to be meeting the needs of the community um, and you know, funding the things that we need to in our city budget in the interim. But like, that's maybe where I would be looking for if we're going to do any nibbling around the edges is things that seem like likely potential federal funding opportunities. And if that doesn't happen in the next year, we learn more. You know, then that's okay. But that's how I would, would be approaching it. Other thoughts. <clears throat> Just one point of clarification from earlier, the, the ballot language was specific to Confluence Park, but it didn't have a dollar amount for P Confluence Park, but it didn't, so it couldn't go to some other park. Mm. Okay. Um, I have a, a anticipate the blue hat. Oh, yes, go ahead, Lauren. Just one other thought. I mean, some of these also, um, you know, for example, the ooh, sorry, the um, social worker position. I think some of these we could also look at um, state funding and our great new legislators, like things that I do think are services that the state should be providing, should be increasing services and funding for, and whether that's embedded in the community. But um, you know, I think for our legislative agenda and the kind of thing we can advocate. I mean, that should be coming from the state, frankly. Um, and you know, I think keeping an eye on it if it's not happening for our community, but just putting a plug in. Um, <laughs> as you should. Uh, I have a couple of questions uh, about like the, so the social equity consultant. Like that, where's there? Um, the CJAC is still working together with the social equity consultant. Is that correct? Yeah. Have been in conversation with creative discourse for ongoing work the current thing that we're hearing a lot of interest from city committees and stuff are dei trainings mm -hmm. and trainings that would take i think hiring consultants with that professional expertise to do so um, I, I think likely the ten thousand that's earmarked for that would actually be going to city staff and city committee mm -hmm. um, contracts, whether it's with a creative discourse or a different consultant, because they have been a little maxed out lately. So we haven't, there's not an, a current active contract with them, I believe, although there, there might still be like a little bit going on, but yeah. um, it would be most likely going towards that work, which, which we've been hearing, uh, we've been getting a lot of requests for. Okay. Uh, and then, the other thing that's on my radar is, you know, we're, we've got forty-five thousand dollars for the homelessness task force, but we've, we're already sort of f flagging some money for, you know, almost ten times that, you know, for for them, uh, you know, based on this report. So it feels a little funny to have both of those things, but I, you know, that's a. So the, the yeah. homelessness task force money is almost entirely um, allocated to the outreach worker. Oh, okay. okay. And actually. Um, not to not to go the other way, but uh, you know if they're going to continue running the the transit center program and the shelters, you know I think we're contributing eighteen thousand, which isn't in the budget. We're just sort of taking it from the general budget. So at some point, we could even you know if we're trading stuff around, we didn't we might even put more into that. Yeah. For, so so that's operating. I think the four hundred twenty five thousand is if we're going to build right. or establish a sort of a more permanent facility type thing or uh, it wouldn't be for program things so okay thank you yeah. okay any other comments folks would like to make about the budget at this point okay thank you and uh, thank you for all the the answers from the staff that is very helpful um, and I think we are ready to move uh, you don't need a, a 
any kind of vote at this point. Um, so anything? It's your budget now. For, yeah. <laughs> anything further about? Oh, uh, Peter Kelman, I see your hand. Go ahead. Bill, could you put your that very good report you did in the agenda packet? The oh, the the, 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 the PowerPoint. Did. Yeah, sure. Yeah, we will. And it'll all be in the budget book too, I think. We, uh, I'm not sure, the PowerPoint that we just did tonight? Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, I mean. We just I, finished I, I it this it. afternoon, so yeah, we will add that to the stuff. Okay, but this happened last year at budget time too. You did yep. a fantastic report, but it wasn't in the, it wasn't in the uh, agenda packet. I get right. it, I get that you, you just finished it. But this, the general public needs to see that, that kind of everyday language approach going through the budget book is beyond what most people are going to be interested or able to do and i, th I think that if we want to engage the public in the budget mm -hmm. that kind of slideshow you just did is the way to do it thank you, thank you. okay uh i think we're ready to move on then um, okay, so the local option sales tax, anything? I know we sort of talked about that a little bit already, but right. uh, anything so, further? Uh, you know, I think the reason for bringing this up, obviously, is we've, we've just been facing budget needs. Um, I think the comments we heard earlier today are, you know, uh, one of the questions is always what impact uh, might it have? I think the question tonight was, do you, is that something, is this a conversation we even want to have? Or uh, should we forget about it? If it is, then we can, you know, draft the language. And I think obviously we'd want to engage the community and the, the business uh, folks. Take a look at uh, other communities that have had this. I think generally the experience has been um, that they have not seen a real change in, in business sales, those kinds of things. But I think we should get, you know, if that's going to be a concern, we should get real data to look at that. Uh, and I would imagine people would, would want to hear more about it. So, uh, but, I th you know, so all I'm saying is if, if we want to do it, it's going to lead to a March vote. We ought to be thinking about how we engage the business community and the community. But if you don't want to do it, then we don't have to talk about it again. I will just start off by saying I'm interested in doing this. I was in favor of the local option sales tax when it came up so many years ago, together with the meal rooms and alcohol tax, I'm still in favor of it now, and mostly uh, it is because we are a destination town and and don't pay for them, and this is a way to capture um, some of that uh, financial support. And uh, one of the things that I think we could uh, highlight for folks is, so in your memo about this, the amount to spend in Montpelier to break even uh, value is $54,000 a year, or on a weekly average is $1,000. You'd have to spend $1,000 a week, roughly, to <clears throat> for a resident to, for, for it to not be worth it for a um, Montpelier resident. And that, that I think is, actually, would you mind explaining that? Sure. Um, so without the the benefit of a sheet to put up here. I'll try to do this as easily as I could. So basically, um, without doing the math, it, it, to be confirmed, but it looks as though the based on the 2021 sales, taxable sales in Montpelier, uh, we would net about 1.675 million. That could be off a little bit. I think probably, you know, there could be some Berlin sales because I think they track it by um, zip code. So. We probably need some, you know, some refining of that. But this is just looking at what the state reports for Montpelier sales. That's what it would be. So that's about 10% of our general fund budget, or about 15% of our property taxes. So, if you take the assumption that this is money we would have spent property taxes on, either we either reduce the tax rate by it, or we buy things for the public that we couldn't have afforded otherwise. But either way, the public is getting the value of this as opposed to being taxed. Um, if you look at how much, so that's about a 15%. So if you take the average resident property value of 275,000, they would save $543 a year 
in property tax. That would be $543 they don't have to spend out of property taxes to get that value of taxes paid. So if you divide that by, you know, the 1% of what they, you know, that's 1% of what they'd have to spend. So that's 1% of $54,000 a year. So if they're paid 1% on these purchases, um, they'd have to spend 54000 before they spent more than $543 in, in sales tax. So then you just divide that by 52 weeks, and it's about $1,000 a week. So the average homeowner would have to spend about $1,000 a week on taxable sales in Montpelier all year to sort of be spending more on the sales tax than what they would be, the benefit they'd be receiving in their property tax. Thank you. I get that. I had to. I had to close my eyes and visualize and follow along very carefully. But I get it. So, um, okay. So the, the the problem with that or the flaw in there is that a lot of people besides homeowners are will be paying the sales tax, mm -hmm. and they won't be seeing that return on their property taxes. Um, and so, um, I I just will kind of state for the record that. I, I'm not a fan of sales taxes. Um, I really actually hate sales tax. In fact, I'm pretty much across the board opposed to sales tax. It's the most regressive tax there is. And, and it really hits people who are at the lower end of the income scale really hard. It makes a big difference if you have to pay that extra 1%. Um, you know, it's, it's something, it could be noticeable for someone where it, for somebody else, it's not really going to be noticeable, and then their taxes might go down if we choose to do that, which is a big if. So I would, it would be my preference to find some other source of revenue than a sales tax. The uh, rooms and meals tax, I'm all for, um, because that really does very directly get get some revenue from people who don't necessarily live here, but are still using our services. Whereas the sales tax, it will be some people, it'll be some visitors will be paying it, but mostly it'll be Montpelier residents who are paying it. Um, so that's, that's where I am on that one. Thank you. Other thoughts? Yeah, go ahead, Lauren. I just have a question. Is, are there, what, what does it apply to? Is it everything? Are there exemptions for food, for example, like non-prepared foods, clothing? So I'm, I'm not a sales tax expert, although I think if, if we want to proceed with this, we will get these answers. I do believe there are some exemptions on clothing. There are exemptions on food, uh, like grocery. I don't think there, when you go to the grocery store, you buy food, then there's, you get, it tells you which things are taxable and which things aren't. Um, uh, but I think things like Paper towels might be taxable, but food aren't, those kinds of things. So, I mean, it certainly, yeah. So there are exemptions, um, and it, this this would follow the state. Anything that is sales tax for the state would, because basically that's how it's collected. The state collects the sales tax, re remits it back to the city after keeping their share out of it. Well, you know, this is, a, this is a little bit of inside baseball, but we, we do make a little bit of extra money on this because, um, the 30% that the state keeps, they keep 5% for administration costs, but then 25% of it goes into the statewide payment low taxes fund to fund towns and cities across the state that have state-owned property. So one of the reasons our own pilot money revenues have been going up steadily over the years is that more and more towns are enacting these local options taxes. So as the pot gets bigger, we're getting more money. So if we put this money, put our share into the pot, we get about 11% of that back because we're one of the bigger, I mean, probably the biggest um, recipients of pilot funds. So we would, in addition to the sales tax, we'd pick up like another $75,000 in our pilot. Um, but that, that is not, that in and of itself is not the reason to do it or not to do it, but it's just a, we benefit. The other communities doing this have brought us up to a very high level of pilot. And I think all the issues that Councilmember Brown <coughs> raises are fair issues, and that's what we've heard before, and I think they're policy issues we've got to wrestle with. Like I said, if you don't want to do it, you don't want to do it, but certainly looking at the budgets we've had the last couple of years, the infrastructure we needs, we had that felt like we need to bring this to you because there's, there really isn't any other source of revenue we're really going to 
be able to do in the, under the state's construct. This is the last one left that we haven't done. Yeah. So. Uh, Jack, go ahead. Thanks. Um, I'm sure if I spent enough time, I could go back over my posts in Green Mountain Daily from many years ago in which I argued in support of both the rooms and meals and uh, local option sales tax. I agree with everything Kerry says about the sales tax as a, a regressive source of funds. Um, th the factors that militate on the other side, in my view, are uh, the fact that, uh, as the mayor pointed out, one of the big drivers of our uh, municipal expenses is people who come in from out of, uh, out of the city to work. And uh, while they're working here, they're also spending money. So to the extent we can extract uh, tax revenues from them, it's going to, uh, it's putting into effect the uh, policy of cost causers pay. And uh, <coughs> we're in less of a good position now because we don't have as many uh, state employees coming into the city so that, uh, as Phil Dodd mentioned uh, earlier, that uh, weakens that a bit. But thinking long term, I think that uh, we will continue to see an increase in people from outside the city working in, in the city. I don't think it's ever going to be the same level as it was before the pandemic. Um, another thing that uh, the manager mentioned at our meeting a meeting or two ago was that uh, part of the reason that the estimated revenues are higher than uh, higher now than they have been in past years is because of the uh, this would also apply to cannabis sales and we have uh, retail cannabis cannabis vendors in the in the city and. Uh, and so that's a source of revenue that uh, is worth looking at it. So I think given the fact that we don't have other uh, significant uh, sources on the horizon to increase our funds, I think we should, we should be exploring it. And that doesn't mean we'll necessarily adopt it. So I guess um, one essential question right now is, um, uh, is anybody opposed to us having it on the agenda again next time for further discussion? Okay, it, it seems like it's the, the, the consensus is it's at least worth talking about, and um, so and it really only becomes timely because there's a deadline by which you have to file charter language with the city clerk before, and so I think and I, I gave you that outline, but I don't have it in front of me. So we just. If we're going to do that, as well as the charter language on the utility, we just have to make sure we hit those. Mm -hmm. Those deadlines are not quite the same as the public hearings for the budgets. Okay. So. Okay. All right. So to be continued on that one, you, you don't, um, Donna, go ahead. Just one question about it. Since we already have the meals and rooms, how is it? How difficult is it for the shops to implement it for the store owner? Is it the same level that our meals and? I don't. You know, I'm not a shop owner, so I don't know. Um, I think the state helps them with that. I think that's part of what you pay the fee for. Um, you know, they're already collecting the sales tax. Presumably, it's adjusting their computer, and it, it's an extra percent. We're not asking them to collect a new tax that they're not already collecting. So I think there's just a bit of the state. Right, because they're sending it to the state. Right, so they collect the it and send act. it in. Okay. It's the same I just activity, thank yes. You. But I don't want to presume for them that it's easy. Yeah, I'm sure. OK. All right, we're going to move on, if that's OK. Thank you. Um, so to be continued on that. Uh, so I think we're ready to move on to the utility status update. And I'll welcome our DPW director, Kurt Monica. PowerPoint presentation. Um, Kurt Monica, Public Works Director. I'll try to keep this quick. 
because I know I'm being followed by the cops here, so. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and so there's a, there's been a lot of discussion recently on particularly the water system. Um, I've had quite a few uh, interviews with the press, and then as we heard tonight, there's been some um, interesting questions from the public uh, on the status. So I thought it was a good time, given um, all the recent interest, to provide an update on where we're at on both the water system and the sewer system. Uh, so I'll quickly cover um, some of the history of the water and sewer and where we started and where we're at today um, uh, where we're on uh, where we're at on replacement schedule for um, footage of pipes in relation to the water and sewer master plan which was uh, adopted in 2016 um, speak about the water system hydraulic analysis which is related to um, the pressures within the water system an update on the sewer uh, where we're at, or what's upcoming on regulations um, from state oversight, and then open it up for questions and discussion. So the water system history, um, uh, the the Berlin Pond was initially started um, or used for the source for Montpelier's water system in the late 1800s. Um, so actually, when I was on, I did a project on Ridge Street for the city um, when I first started and actually we took out a piece of pipe that was stamped 1899 and that was only you know um, 12 13 years ago so we have a lot of really old pipes um, when the pond was first used for the water source that's when the, sis the city's pressure was probably about 170 in the downtown 170 psi um, and over the years, they that was when the inlet was actually where the where the plant is now, the treatment plant. And over the years, they extended um, the pipeline up to the pond, and gained you know another 60 feet of elevation, which translates to about 30 psi. So, since the late 1800s, we've been at um, you know 170 psi compared to the 200, and then over you know the next you know basically in the 1950s, I believe is when that was finally extended all the way into the the center of Berlin Pond where we have our pressures today. Um, <coughs> all during that time cast iron pipe was used. That was really the only uh, pressure pipe available back in those days. Um, in the 80s the city based on those pressures um, constructed the booster stations and expanded the service area so that those two tanks were um, one is on Terra Street and one is on Town Hill. They both have pump stations associated with them which boost you know the pressure um, that's coming from the pond and then boosted up to storage tanks to be able to serve a broader range of uh, customers. In the 90s there was a lot of uh, water projects. Um, the primarily large diameter water mains were installed. This was really for fire protection and to bring the water to these tanks. Um, during that time period ductile iron was the primary piping for the city. Um, in 2000, it's actually when I was um, still in college, I interned on the construction of the water plant. Until that time, you know, the city was basically j being served chlorinated pond water. There's no treatment at all, just a, just a chemical drip. So I was pretty astonished to coming out of all my college classes seeing the capital of Vermont is, is drinking pond water. <laughs> uh, uh, um, <laughs> and it really wasn't that long ago, if you put, you know, think about that. Um, in 2016, we adopted the master plan. It was a, uh, you know, identified as a council priority that uh, we have, um, you know, aging infrastructure and the pipes needed to, you know, accelerated attention. So that master plan 
Um, like Bill mentioned earlier, is, is inflation plus 1%, and that 1% is intended to go for infrastructure. So that is our um, you know, average proposed rate increase uh, for the water and sewer utilities. Um, uh, about that same time, 2016, we adopted HDPE as our piping standard. Um, I don't feel that has a lot of advantages for a high pressure system and being able to um, basically stretch and expand and absorb some pressure uh, fluctuations. It also has a high pressure rating, 250 PSI, so there's a safety buffer above and beyond what the city's pressure is at. And then the, in the most recent um, uh, bigger project that we've done is to bring Murray Hill online uh, which added, you know, fairly substantial user base um, and, uh, you know, helps with revenue. On the sewer side, um, the city's system was initially built with essentially one pipe for all stormwater and all sewer, and it all went to the rivers. Uh, you can still see around town there's what they call the sanitary dams, which basically just kept the water level up in the river um, to keep the solids from the waste uh, underwater to keep the odors down and those are still you can still see them in in the north branch in 1962 uh, there was a major major project in the city that um, took the sewer and uh, and um, took basically the intercepted all the sewers from all the buildings and put it to a separate pipeline and constructed the very first version of the wastewater plant and that was only you know, 1962 until that point, all of the sewage went straight to the rivers. Um, in the 60s, pump stations were constructed. Um, most of them were in the early 60s. Those are still our pump stations today, uh, getting very, um, you know, aged. And then the, the most recent one is around 1980, the newest one. In the 90s, um, the separation of uh, stormwater was the big push, um, you know, state mandated to um, reduce the number of overflow events. So just to recap, CSOs are, we still have a lot of uh, stormwater connected to the, to the sewer system. And during really high rain events, the, the piping cannot carry all the storm and sewer together. And, it, and there's these, there's six now structures around the city that overflow to the river. Um, Again, in 2016, we adopted the master plan to accelerate both infra you know, the um, aging infrastructure replacement as well as CSO separation projects. And then in 2019, we did two major planning documents uh, identifying which roof drains are still connected to the sewer, contributing to overflows, as well as our long-term control plan, which is really our guiding document to uh, eliminate um, sewer overflows. And then most recently was the large um, improvement project at the water resource recovery facility. So on the master plan, um, you know, probably can't see these numbers, but uh, you know, we've done we've done a lot of a um, lot of pipe projects since 2016. I, you know, I think it's a testament that the, that the master plan is effective; it's working. Um, just the hi the highlighted line there is, you know, we've replaced um, just under 10,000 linear feet of sewer main. Uh, since 2016 and almost um, 17,000 feet of water main. So it is a little bit behind our targets in the master plan, um, but a lot of that is related to the pandemic. We did essentially lose a year of construction. Um, the state actually shut down construction projects. We got an exemption for the wastewater plant upgrade, but um, at the time we were doing Clarendon Avenue and, and we lost basically all summer. Um, one of the other approaches that we're taking um, in achieving a steady state is what we call asset divestment. So a lot of streets have two sewer mains or two water mains, and if you can reduce that to a single line, that's um, that much footage you don't have to replace, and it's that much footage that's no longer within your asset management program. So those aren't captured in the table on the left as far as you know comparison to uh, the master plan, but they do really contribute to um, you know, achieving steady state. Um, I think that's there. So the this is really getting to the pressures in the water system. We have uh, contracted with a consulting engineer to do a, a full evaluation of um, the water system, and that includes uh, what it would take to reduce the pressure in the downtown. Um, they have given us just some, we don't have the report yet, it's currently underway. 
uh, but they have given us some preliminary feedback. Uh, they're going to uh, look at three alternatives. Alternative one is not to do anything, just kind of keep it the way it is. It's obviously not a good option. Um, alternative two, reduce the pressure to 115 PSI in the downtown. So that's, you know, not quite half, but a significant reduction. Um, they're indicating we probably would need four new booster pump stations. There may be some uh, high-level service customers that wouldn't we would have to probably drill wells for because we wouldn't have enough pressure to serve them anymore. And then a relocation of the pressure-reducing vault on Ten Hill. Um, so we don't have cost what that would take financially or you know what where these um, pump stations would go. So we don't know if there's actually you know the land available. Um, but that is the option. <coughs> we are taking it, you know, uh, seriously and looking at it, um, you know, with an open mind. At, um, and we'll see where that report comes in. But there, you know, just to point out that there are some high-level impacts and some infrastructure needed to accomplish a pressure reduction. And then the alternative three is sort of what the city's been doing is um, is replacing the distribution piping with you know high pressure pipe that's really consistent with uh, the master plan that's currently in place. The other another item that they that we're looking at as part of this report is reducing pressure spikes. So um, that can have an impact on the number of leaks. And um, we've had just one preliminary meeting with um, CVMC. They're interested uh, in getting out of the water business. Uh, they have an existing water tank that is aging that needs to be replaced um, and there's a potential that the city could uh, take over that tank and use that to feed the, the downtown um, and that would eliminate the city having to pump directly from the water plant into the system and those pumps have to rotate and every time those pumps rotate you get a pressure spike that can um, you know result in leaks at the city and in the downtown. Uh, I think that's we've done a long we've come a long ways in, in smoothing out that transition between the pump uh, rotations, um, but I think it you know it would still be improved by having a, a gravity feed system rather than a pump system. Uh, one other consideration is um, is the impact of fire capacity. As we do, if we were to re reduce the pressure, um, your available fire flow then also becomes reduced, and uh, that's something else we'll be looking at in the report. Um, and then uh, under our permit condition, the other last thing is related to fire, um, fire flow capacity is we, we will be required to um, identify all of the water mains that are undersized to meet the necessary fire flow, which is 500 gallons a minute, um, uh, without dropping pressure below 20 PSI. So um, basically it's going to point out all the all of the lines that are not in compliance uh, with the rules. Um, <coughs> so this report will serve as um, what we call preliminary engineering report. So it sets us up for being eligible for funding. So when that federal money does come down the line, we're through the first step. I anticipate that federal money will be channeled through the state. So the state has reviewed this contract, they've approved it, and they'll be reviewing the results. So, um, you know, it's an, there's a, another benefit to doing this work is in, in that we are curing ourselves up for funding for both, um, you know, the, the hospital option or um, line replacements. Uh, update on the sewer system. We have a couple big, really big CSO projects uh, upcoming this summer. Um, the, the State Street sewer main is, you know, I think one of our um, biggest re restrictions in the sewer system. That line, uh, that main pipe goes underneath an old steam line and comes back up, and uh, we have not been able to clean it uh, we've in, I don't know, at least 10 years. So there's probably a, a whole lot of sediment uh, accumulated in that piping, and now, uh, you know, the 32-inch 30, 30, um, pipe is probably, you know, down to... 10 inches so you can get all that capacity back we're going to really drop our n our frequency of uh, CSO overflows in addition in addition we'll be also separating out a large parking lot out of the sewer system and then East State Street is just um, the sewer system is terrible we tried to camera it and it has all these uh, bends and and pipe size fluctuations and uh, we could not get the camera up through uh, the piping so uh, that's in bad shape it did fail a few years ago and we had emergency repair on the sewer system 
Um, and there's a, a you know a massive drainage area. All of East State Street goes to the sewer, and then the, um, that storm water from East State passes through four of our six CSO structures. So there's four opportunities to reduce uh, overflow frequencies. Um, and then um, we have a big project at the wastewater plant, phase two, that was bonded for last year. Um, it handles, um, you know, it deals with PFAS and the solids, uh, odor control, which is a permanent requirement, and the, the last piece of old infrastructure at the plant, which is the secondary clarifiers. A little bit unregulatory compliance. Um, so the hydraulic analysis I talked about is was a permit requirement from the state under our permit to operate. They will mandate um, a replacement schedule once the hydraulic analysis is done, and it likely, I've been told, will be um, faster than what our master plan is set up to fund. Um, so I'm not sure how we'll, we'll address that, but um, hopefully there will be a lot of federal money um, available to us, and and that will be important. Um, the other option to replacing the lines is to reduce the amount of fire protection the city has. So that could potentially mean abandoning the hydrants on the smaller diameter mains. Um, but there's other concerns of that. Water quality, we use them for flushing. Uh, so, you know, this, this study will, um, and what comes out of it after the state review could have some significant impacts um, on on fire flow capacity at this on the water system or funding levels needed um, to maintain that fire flow capacity uh, and then you know how pressure reduction p potentially factors into that is still unknown until we get that report on the sewer side um, it's all regulated under our wastewater discharge permit um, through our long-term control plan we are required to do updates every five years um, we have the odor control mandate uh, through a notice of alleged violation and we also have uh, ammonia limits coming up in our next permit so we are l working with our consultant to see if we can address the, n the required treatment for ammonia in this next project sort of combine it in one you get economy of scale and we'll be all um, ready for that next permit and right now that you know that looks like we should be a achievable for a relatively low cost Oops. And that is it. Open up to questions. <laughs> okay. Um, I know I could talk about this stuff for a long time, so I'm going to not do that. Um, so I have just one question, which is, so uh, in regards to the high pressure, the, you know, the, all the, the questions that folks have uh, for us about, you know, well, how are you addressing the high pressure? The answer really is that you've got to study out, we're going to see what they recommend, what, what some um, consultants recommend. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Yep. I was really pleased that you've given us such a detail. In the past, whenever Tom was asked when he was here, was, is this going to cost millions to change it? Um, but you can see how complex it is, it, it, and it isn't a new problem. One of my questions is, some of those pipes are so old, no matter what kind of pressure we had, they were going need to be, need to be replaced. Is that true? Uh, yes, that's true. And you know, what we discovered was the, the ductile iron installed in the 90s uh, is actually failing in a lot of cases faster than the cast iron in installed in there, you know, 1800s. So, and that's because of the acidic soils uh, that we have. Clay soils are acidic. They're also uh, conductive. And, um, you know, a lot of homes in Montpelier, they ground their electrical service to their water service. And then that puts a small current through um, the water system and it just accelerates oh, wow. corrosion. So we've just found that w the, all those conditions in Montpelier have led to r really quick um, a failure of the duct iron pipe. So we're getting like 20 to 40 years out of the ductile where the cast is, you know, 120 and, and in a lot of cases better condition. Well, maybe that's another message we should send out, not to do that. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, it, I don't think it's legal anymore, but oh, these... Okay. Um, 
you know, if it was these houses are 100 years old, then they're kind of grandfathered. Gotcha. Other questions? Okay. I, I don't have a question. I just want to thank you for putting this together. I know that um, this was a lot of work to pull this presentation together, and I really appreciate you taking the time to do it. And I think it's um, between this and, and uh, how much information there's been in the news lately, I think that a lot of really good detailed information is getting out about the work that you're doing, about the plans that you have, and about the, the challenges that we're facing and how you are approaching them. Um, so I just wanted to thank you for that. Thanks, Kurt. I, I think this is a great presentation. I think that uh, people watching should recognize that uh, the city is not just ignoring the problem. You know, it's it it takes hard work to fix <laughs> fix hard problems, and that's what we have here. Um, to be clear on um, what the presentation is, am I right in thinking that right now? the pressure coming down from Berlin Pond is so high that even to get to the higher elevations anywhere else in the city, it's enough to get down into the city and push the water up to those higher elevations without any pumping on our part? Well, in some areas, right? So we have the two pump stations, so those do require pumping to maintain the minimum required pressures. Um, but yeah, a lot of locations rely on high pressure coming from the from the plant to get up to those hills where they're not served by the a tank mm -hmm. and uh, you you showed the diagram of when different uh, things were changes were implemented in the system uh, the, I remember the folklore used to be that there were a couple of times a year in the city where uh, the water would taste kind of muddy and people would say that was when Berlin Pond was turning over because of the change in, in temperature. Was that an accurate description of what was happening? Uh, yes, that's true and uh, it still happens today. Um, you know, it, it can, uh, you do get more sort of uh, turbidity when the pond stratifies. Um, so, but when now we can address that with, you know, uh, the powder, the carbon addition helps take out those toast no, uh, taste and odor concerns. Yeah, I don't, I don't taste the change anymore the way I used to. <laughs> um, and w a resident came tonight and said, well, what, what people should do as an individual measure is put a couple, put two pressure reducing valves and then also put a pressure, uh, pressure release valve in their system. It, is that actually a feasible uh, and effective thing for people to do? Um, well, I'm not sure about a, a pressure relief valve. On, I've never seen that in a residential application. Um, you know, I think a lot of it is is uh, to know the age of the equipment in your home. So uh, I you know I think if if it, your house is 100 years old and you still have the same PRV, you know, absolutely, that's time to change it, even 50 years. Um, and I do, I have seen um, dual installations of, of uh, pressure relief valves. I don't think that's ne a bad idea necessarily. Um, if you have a good um, high quality pressure reducing valve in place, you don't necessarily need to, but if people have concerns, um, I, you know, there's nothing wrong with doing that either. Is, is there a way for a homeowner to uh, find out what their uh, water pressure is coming into their house? Um, well, there's, you can put, uh, if there's a, like a hose connection, um, before their pressure reducing valve, they could put a gauge on. We can help if they call public works office. Um, and from this hydraulic analysis, we're actually going to get more detailed information about where the pressures are uh, within the city. But, um, we can give uh, guidance on approximate values from public works office. Thanks. Don is nodding her head. So she... My condo just went through a dreadful water leak that led to all of our reducers being damaged with sediment. And we found out that if you have your plumber come and attach, you have a hose, you have a, a spigot on the bottom of your water heater. And if your plumber attaches a pressure gauge there, they can tell you. 
and they came through and tested all, all of ours after this incident, and most of us needed new pressure reducers. Uh, but they didn't advise more than one. So I think you have to talk to your plumber. There's always a difference of opinion. And sure enough, the one person who had two, they both were damaged. They didn't help one another. But. Hmm. And there is a release valve on the water heater that they may have been talking about. And it comes out the spigot and down. Yep. Um, Lauren, and then I want to go to Linda Berger. Thanks, Kurt. This was super helpful and totally agree that this level of detail like, is really informative. Um, it seems like a lot of stormwater projects, so I'm excited we're pursuing the stormwater utility. It seems like that will be a helpful way to stay on top of uh, these big projects. My one question, which might be totally infeasible, but I remember at one energy advisory committee meeting, they had talked about how there's some like cool technology that they install in the pipe that's like, I think it's a pressure reducer, but it creates energy. So it's like this new renewable energy thing. Just throwing it out there if we're doing an analysis and there might be like different pots of funding that that could open up that, you know, or if we're doing this really expensive upgrade anyway, that what would be infeasible to uh, normally install if it was part of a different of project or something maybe it becomes feasible so just throwing it out there <laughs> <laughs> don't know much about it yeah no i mean so i think mary city has high and low pressure lines and they did install a system like that um you know pressure reducing vaults are good potentially good opportunities um to make power um, through turbines um, I don't know that Berla, that Barry's was very successful. They've had issues with it, but that doesn't mean um, that it's not worth looking at. So depending on, you know, where we land on available pressure reduction, we certainly can look into that. Cool. Okay. Uh, Linda Berger, go ahead. Hi, Kurt. Um, I have a question about the uh, wastewater discharge permit. Has the new one been issued? No, it has not. And could you explain a little bit about what the process is that you're looking for and the state's looking for? Well, this, the state sort of, um, they reached out to us and gave us a heads up that, you know, because you're doing this upgrade at the plant, we wanted to give you the opportunity um, to consider um, what your new limits will be on ammonia. The, the city has never had ammonia limits. Um, and so, but we've been on under a monitoring requirement uh, from the state for the past few years. Um, so we have the data on what our levels are at. Um, so it was really, I, I think within, I don't know the exact time frame, but I, within the next year, we're anticipating being issued our new permit. And, um, and then we'll have a, a time frame of, I think, three to five years to meet those uh, new discharge limits on the ammonia. Thank you. Great, thanks. Um, any other comments or questions from, yes? Just quickly, first, thanks, Kurt. Great presentation. I hope people really saw that. Secondly, just perhaps a message to all that, for, you know, the water pressures are not new. This is something that's been around for a long time, the city, and we have been on top of trying to fund it and do the work. I think just as you hear about this, and la you know, I, I appreciate people's frustration, pr especially when they hear something in the news and they think it's a new situation. Um, but to, to do a quick fix would be millions of dollars, and so I don't know that people would want to put that kind of money on their water rates. So, um, you know, DPW's really been on top of this and trying to address it, and I think that this study will really help direct the work in the future. So, uh, Kurt and all the folks, well, Kurt in his capacity as, as our deputy with, has really been on this all along, but the prior directors have all paid close attention to this as well. So, uh, it's good that we got to tell the story a little bit tonight. Yep. Yes, thank yep. you. Okay, we are ready to move on then to uh, the police presentation. So, welcome up, Chief. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Oh, well, it feels like it.
Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council, City Manager, Assistant City Manager, members of the public, Deputy Chief Nordenson. I'm Brian Pete with the Montpelier Police Department, and today I'd like to uh, just give the Council a very brief summarization of um, the projects and the accomplishments and the things that, uh, that the Department has yet to do um, over the last uh, two and a half years. Uh, the first slide just uh, gives you the, the breakdown of some of the, um, of, of specifically what I'd like to, to inform the council and the public with today. And, and moving on to um, the accomplished projects that we had in the year 2020. Um, when, uh, upon coming aboard, uh, Deputy Chief Nordenson and I conducted a climate assessment survey and we did that initial organizational assessment, uh, especially because of the the, the many calls uh, across the country regarding uh, the policing profession. And, um, and, and that's something that we took extraordinarily serious because any organization or any, any profession that has that much, the power that we do needs to be looked at and needs to be scrutinized and, and, and criticized. So, so we uh, went ahead, did the assessment. Um, we worked with the police review committee um, we actually implemented a trial uh, software survey for a system called Officer Survey in which, uh, again, we were dealing with COVID at the time and we were trying to figure out ways to get um, feedback from the community as to what they thought about the service that they were getting from the Montpelier Police Department. We implemented a uh, threat assessment capability, again, and, and that led us to additions to the strategic plan. One of the biggest things in law enforcement is you, you can't throw a whole bunch of things at the wall and see what sticks. You have to, you can't paint everybody with the same brush. And we have to do intelligence-led policing strategies, not broken windows type theories, because you have to know what the threats are that are out there and, and the potential dangers uh, that are out there and, 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 and the issues that our community face and what those priorities are and then add them uh, into the strategic plan in order to be truly effective in uh, reducing crime and the perception of crime within a community. In the year 2021, after the, uh, the insurrection at the, uh, the, in the U.S. Capitol, we um, worked with partners to establish a safety plan and working and pushing back any threats that were coming to the city of Montpelier and to the Capitol complex. I'm extraordinarily proud of, of what the department has done and the dedication to the officers and dispatchers and the staff members there, and especially grateful for um, the support that we received from our sister municipalities. It was, um, it was overwhelming, and, and that's gonna be a word you'll probably hear me say in, in, in so many different ways um, as I uh, give you all this presentation. We also streamlined our onboarding and uh, promotional um, processes. We've in incorporated uh, critical hire, which is intelligence, uh, which is intelligence, uh, emotional intelligence indicator that helps us to understand the types of folks who are applying to become law enforcement officers within the department. So it's, it's a level of maturity. It's a level of assessing resiliency when, when stress happens and making sure that, again, we want to invest early on in hiring the right people rather than paying the price, whether it's liability, whether it's safety, and whether it's our own reputation in not hiring the right people. Uh, we also implemented police app with, uh, and promotional scoring rubrics and in uh, and, and various types of hiring interviews. We, we've changed that, gone, going away from the paramilitary style, the old way of, of sitting across from a long table with one person and trying to scare them out of it. Um, we looked at just having regular conversations as normal human beings because they're looking at us just as much as we're looking at them. And the, and the generations that we're dealing with now are extraordinarily savvy. And, and, and they're not, you, you pull that old fashioned type of stuff with people, you're gonna lose talent. And so we wanna make sure that we, that we uh, grow just as much as the, uh, as the folks that we're trying to establish. We, we don't wanna be those old dogs. Um, so we also did establish a very robust succession plan and, and with that succession planning, uh, if, if I may, a quick story in one of the places that I worked at, um, I went in and I spoke to, to the detective section and they were telling me all about one detective. This detective was great, this detective's this, this detective's that. Every time we get something, we should have that detective and, and we shouldn't give this case to that person and my question to them was, well, why? Why don't we have a detective session that's just, that's full of detective A? 
And, and that's what succession planning is. It's identifying uh, people with talent and it's identi identifying people that, that have a desire and that have a skill set and, and fostering that and moving folks along. So I think with the succession plan that we, that we implemented and by keeping communication as open as we could and exposing it, our, our staff to as many angles of policing and administrative work as we could, um, internal promotional processes were extraordinarily difficult because everybody uh, who applied were, ex were, were very capable, uh, very competent, and, 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 and had very strong leadership ability. So that's a, that's a good thing and that's a bad thing. Um, but, but throughout that, um, you know, folks have met those high qualifications, and I think they're the highest ones that, uh, of any police organization and within the state. And, and out of that, um, and, and I don't want to downplay the skills of, and, and what they bring to the table, but, but I think it's a reflection to our commitment that we have um, uh, a young lady who is in charge, who is our dispatch supervisor, Carrie McCool, and we have our first female sergeant uh, in the history of the Montpelier Police Department. Uh, some of the other things uh, that we looked into or that we brought aboard was the uh, high intensity drug trafficking uh, agencies, the OD mapping, uh, our dispatch uh, uh, folks are able to look at trends and, and where ODs are happening within uh, our county and other places. And then we use that information as far as like how we're outreaching to the communities and how we're looking at uh, potential tr uh, 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 folks that we need to target for proactive investigations. We've incorporated CompStat uh, uh, intelligence-led policing metrics, but due to low staffing, uh, that's been difficult because there is, it's an exhaustive amount of um, administrative work that's required when we don't have a true CAD or um, reporting system. Uh, benchmark analytics for an early warning system, that helps us to, to collect information on and, and, and looking at where we are as far as is incidences of use of force, um, as far as incidences of performance evaluations, complaints from the community, so that we can bring all this stuff out at the push of a button to make ourselves transparent to the communities that we serve. With benchmark analytics, it's also, again, especially in, 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 it's imperative that uh, we want to catch people before they go down uh, a pathway where they can disrupt and destroy their professional lives and their personal lives and Again, uh, you know, th there's, there's, there's issues of suicide uh, in, in the news, and it affects everyone, but especially first responders are especially vulnerable for it. And benchmark analytics helps us in, in, in identifying people who may need a little bit more of attention. Um, and, and then coupled with, again, one of the other things that I want to bring up, again, with that gratefulness is, uh, is the commitment from our city manager, our assistant city manager, and, and for the, from the council in recognizing those stressful issues. We brought in advanced interviewing training. Uh, we applied for a federal uh, officer wellness grant for the entire county of Washington County. Again, uh, I, I point to the unfortunate incident that happened uh, in Berlin where there was an officer that did commit a, a murder-suicide, and, and that shows um, the urgency of the now and how we have to and why we have to identify these types of issues. Uh, we did apply for and win a CRITEC grant for officer survival training. CRITEC stands for the Collaborative Reform um, Initiative Assistance Center, and through that, that training we got um, uh, you know, it helped officers as officers across the country were being targeted, um, unfortunately, but, but more importantly, uh, that the murder of George Floyd, um, positional asphyxiation, and the, the tactics that we learned through that training pulled away from traditional ways of how law enforcement utilized force and got away from putting pressure on the head, neck, and the spine, especially when we have a person in a prone position. And, and the person who taught us is a homegrown Vermonter and a previous Montpelier police officer who left off to the Department of Homeland Security and worked for uh, the uh, HSI unit there, and he came back to give us some very good training. Um, we've uh, improved access or created access to additional investigative records such as CLEAR, eGuardian, and the Law Enforcement Enterprise Portal with the, with the Federal Bureau of Investigations. And then we also won uh, a little over $150,000 in DHS grants, which we use for building security upgrades in City Hall 
in the police department. We also procured a virtual reality training machine with that money. And then we brought in anti-vehicle barriers because when I, when I first got here, uh, Nord told me one of the biggest things that keeps him up at night is he doesn't, all the festivities and all of the, the events that we have in Montpelier, he does not want to see a repeat of someone driving through our community and hurting our community when they're doing nothing more than trying to enjoy the time they have with each other and with their families. So we invested in that and we also helped the Capitol Police get their grant to, to add to those the same uh, anti-vehicle barriers that we've got. And then we've also implemented, um, uh, brought in new crime scene processing kits. In 2022, we won, uh, we got another grant from the Stanton Foundation. K-9 Atlas is here and he'll be going off in February to uh, narcotics training. So we got that without uh, having to ask the, uh, the city for additional money. We it, it, thank you to uh, the generosity again. Um, it mean, and it means a lot to me because this is something near and dear to my heart. But uh, one of the things that Nora and I and, and, and uh, Tony and especially Neil before he left, uh, this is big for us is to make sure that we can do everything we can to help our staff whenever they're when they're dealing with problems and issues so thank you for the funding um, and then we did sign into a ten thousand dollar contract with the uh, Vermont first uh, Center for first responder wellness in which we have uh, folks uh, who come out and talk to our staff on a repeated basis on a contractual basis daytime nighttime afternoon and just to see how things are going um, again, thanks to the PRC and the, uh, the council, we've implemented a body worn camera program. We've implemented a vehicle replacement program and we brought in new in-car computers for each of our uh, uh, patrol vehicles. We brought in uh, human trafficking training through a grant that uh, we did not have to reach into any of our coffers for. Uh, we incorporated Power DMS, which is a policy system. One of the PRC recommendations was to put our policies out there and our current um, uh, system does not have the bandwidth to put out all the policies that, that we have. But through Power DMS, you can go on the Montpelier Police De uh, Department's website and you can see each one of our policies and it's, it's easy to update these policies within a click of a button. It also helps us to, to ensure that our officers and our staff are reading these policies and we can actually even add tests to them to make sure that there's comprehension there. Uh, we won another grant through the Department of Homeland Security in 2022, and we used that, and we just completed um, training uh, 40 hours, two weeks of training for a, uh, a countywide tactical team. And I'll go into this uh, a little bit more about the regionalization of, in, of shared assets, um, but uh, th the threats are real, and, and they're getting alarmingly a little bit more, uh, more worrisome, and especially with where we are. So we, uh, we took that initial step and now we have officers who are trained um, to, in concepts that are designed to minimize use of force rather than utilizing force. And by I say that is, is uh, so how can tactics be de-escalatory? De well, the whole thing is, A, you don't go rushing into a building on a search warrant with the idea that I need to, st I need to get the drugs before they flush them down the toilet. That's 1980s and 1990s BS. You don't do that type of stuff. You, you enter into homes uh, in a very methodical way and the, the whole concept is to see the person before they see you and then engage that you don't have to use deadly force or any types of force and it works. And it sincerely works. And, uh, and, and through this, I think that we've, uh, we're gonna be bringing on, um, we're gonna see this as a trend throughout the state of Vermont. We, uh, we have been part of a systems, systems improvement committee throughout the state looking at how we can ad uh, address criminal justice issues within law enforcement. We've also assisted in, uh, in, in, in giving feedback on the statewide use of force policy and body-worn camera policy developments. We standardized threat and vulnerability reporting and projections, and then we've also worked hard to get that, uh, at least to start, the $2.4 million uh, grant from the state for to update our communications infrastructure. Um, we've also procured dispatch consoles, which are, as I understand from Kerry, they are sitting at the department now. The only thing that we're waiting for are just the, uh, is just the furn furniture. We've worked with Barry, uh, a very strong partnership again, to uh, make sure we have redundancy backup operations. And, uh, and we've updated our policies to modernize, to, 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 
to, to hit those 21st century uh, policing pillars. Th those include use of force, whistleblower, which is uh, you don't see many people, but it protects officers who have that mandated duty to report um, from reprisal. Criminal threat assessments, exits, interviews, duty to intervene, um, crime scene protection, firearms, vehicle pursuits, body-worn cameras, and uh, national incident management systems. Uh, just really briefly, NIBRS reporting is just nothing more than just, this is just to give you kind of a snapshot of, um, again, uh, from annual reporting, I just pulled these numbers from, tells you the, the level of calls for service that we've had in 2020 and 21, um, and, and that the top 10 incidences have rotated between traffic stops, disorderly conduct, and, you know, the one year you'll have 10 of these, the next year one of them will drop off and the other one will pop up. But the bottom line is, this is a, the fact that there is low crime, and I would say a perception of low crime within the city of Montpelier is, is a testament to the, the work and, and, and that, that officers, d dispatchers, parking, that everybody puts into getting to understand their community members, gaining the trust, the one-on-one -on -one trust, and then uh, looking at proactivity when it's warranted. And, but more so than that, it's a reflection of the community of Montpelier. It's a reflection of the standards of the people that we serve. And this is why we're extraordinarily lucky that we don't have to deal with a lot of the, the problems that other places, to include places in, in Vermont, have to deal with. So uh, with that, I'll just turn it over to... Okay, so <laughs> so Will, he, he, he got me the way, the way I pushed him up in front the, the, the last few minutes. So, so re really briefing to touch on staffing and morale. Um, we're currently sitting at 13 sworn officers with the, uh, within the department. Our dispatch is fully staffed. Um, we have one officer who's on administrative leave, and upon my leave, we will be down to 13 officers available to work. I'm sorry, 11 officers available to work. Um, but uh, we have three candidates who are scheduled for the next academy class, which will begin early 2023. And then we're starting to see more quality applicants trickle in. And um, uh, and I'll get to that. And, and there's, I, I think, a, there's a huge reason as to why. Um, and, and I'll get to that one in a little bit. Our, our staff has felt some significant relief with the scheduling changes that, um, that um, our city manager, assistant city manager, um, helped us uh, to plan through. And especially, thank you, thank you um, from our staff and from their families um, for, for the increases. Uh, it, it's really helped. And, uh, and so we will, always continue to manage numerous competing administrative and operational priorities. Uh, the feedback uh, lo nationally and locally is that there's still some lingering vocal anti-law enforcement sentiment and that's contributing to low morale and the ability to attract people overall into the profession. But what I will say and what I have always said is that Montpelier and our city council support our staff and they support this police department and there has never ever been a doubt that that has been the case. Despite what anyone may have said or despite any rumors out there in the street, we don't, we enjoy the support and, and the trust of our council. And that is one of the things that makes us extraordinarily attractive to other members, uh, other law enforcement uh, officers within this state because several times before hey I'm ready to come to my peel or hey man you guys are doing this you guys are doing this well why don't you come on over oh I can I'm I'm vested and, and several of them have them been VSP with all due respect but they're vested in those pensions there and they can't like necessarily walk over but it, it's it's well known that uh, that this this council is this council is tough in the sense that this council challenges us to come out of that comfort zone and to be better than what we can they, you all see where we can go, and you push us to that. And so while that parts of it uh, is, is tough, as it should be, what's never in question is your support for our organization. So looking at some of the projects in work, the CIT program, uh, the steering committee has been in place for about a year now. The training program is nearly complete. We're, we've got the syllabuses, everything worked out, who's gonna be training. I just have to do a few scenarios and then uh, early to, I'm sorry, in March. 
So, uh, and we've also, I've also talked to the Vermont Association of Chiefs of Police and told them about the CIT program, and they are all on board willing to send their staff to CIT training once it becomes available. It's 40 hours, um, but it's well worth it. Um, and then we also, uh, there was a $150,000 uh, grant from Thrive that went to Washington County Mental Health Services, and Montpelier had also, has also petitioned the state, and uh, we're waiting to hear back from a possible another $150,000 that we can use to implement into standing up a CIT program. Now, the thing about a CIT program, it's more than just training for law enforcement officers and first responders. It's bringing about a response system in dealing with people who are in critical, who are in crisis mode. It's not training, it's how do we humanely deal with folks who are having who undoubtedly one of the worst days of their life, and how are we helping them out of it, rather than compounding their problems by pushing them into the criminal justice system or making the experience, a traumatic experience, even more traumatic for them. So that's what the CIT program is about. Um, our final session of the COPS Office Grant, which is the anti-bias online training. We are a participant site, and after early 2023, we expect that this grant that the COPS Office gave to this training group, uh, of which Montpelier has had a part in, will be the national standard in law enforcement officers getting implicit bias training. So it's no longer, you know, finding somebody who says that, oh, I can teach you an implicit bias training. Well, what are your credentials? What are your training? What are your experiences? We're going to set a national model for all law enforcement agencies throughout the country as far as uh, anti-bias online training. Uh, we've, uh, have, we have to implement the communications infrastructure upgrade and assist the state in dispatching. We have to uh, purchase a base radio station replacement, and we have to look at a true CAD systems and investigative software that has an emphasis on fighting domestic terrorism, and I'll dive into that really quickly. So my final slide is, uh, and there's a typo there, it should be MPD's accomplishments could not have happened without the support and trust of the city manager. <laughs> Could not, uh, you, but yeah, I did. But the, but it would not be Brian Pete if I did not have a screw up someplace in a slide, and it's a terrible screw, like the screw up about Laguna Beach. So um, they don't know that. <laughs> but uh, so so I, from from the bottom of my heart, um, one thing I've learned being here. Uh, through Bill, through Cameron, through Kelly, through the leadership, and through how I've seen this council react, where I came from, is this is, I don't see this, uh, whether it's in Chicago, whether it's, it's in New Mexico, and, and the one word that I would say is, is grace, uh, and that I wish that people understood um, the level of of stress that you voluntarily take on. I'm not sucking up to you because that, that's not me, but there is, there is a level of stress that comes with this because there is an altruistic expectation that folks who, who put themselves out for public service do. And I have seen you all push and claw to make this community better. And I, and, and I hope that the members of the community, and I'm pretty sure they are, are very cognizant of that and um, so thank you. Thank you for training and teaching me and preparing me for um, the next level of, of my professional career. Um, so I'll say that, uh, I'll, I'll ask uh, that, um, that uh, going forward that you look to preserve qualified immunity for police officers in Vermont. Qualified immunity, there's a lot of people who have opinions on it. There are a lot of people who are academics that talk about it, but it's one thing to be out in the field to be dealing with it. Qualified immunity does not change a culture. What changes a culture is leadership and oversight in the sense that you have to have sunshine and you have to have transparency and that leads into accountability because no matter if you take away my qualified immunity, but I can still hide somebody's wrongful acts from you, you'll never be able to, to hold us accountable. And sunshine and transparency and accountability, that's what it is. To know what officers are dealing with, to know what officers have done and what officers are being accused of, and, and, and how we're doing the process. That helps everything. So I would say that it's transparency 
is the key to stop a culture that has too long um, looked into covering for each other. Um, I would say to advocate for regional consolidation. Um, EMS, fire, there, there are all kinds of reports out there that are saying there are fewer and fewer volunteers that are coming in to do it, and in law enforcement especially. And um, the way that we're doing things right now, we will not survive in Vermont if we do not consolidate or regionalize the resources that we have left. The projections of getting out of this, if, if we're fortunate, are we're looking at five years. Um, so I will say that again, um, we, the chiefs and I in Washington County have spoken offline several times and um, there is, this is the time. This is the time. Law enforcement chiefs in Washington County have talked about this. And, and I, don't, I think at this particular point in time, the, the only thing that may stop it would be a, a, a political ego. It's not gonna be a law enforcement ego that, hey, I need to be the chief, I need to be in charge, or, or the tradi traditional bravo. I think it's just going to take that political will to look and see what that would look like. Um, I would, uh, again, fully endorse the implementation of the CRO program. That will help us to continue to build the, uh, that's the community resource officer program to build the trust between us and our community. This is key. Um, we're still working towards that. We've got the right person in the spot and we just have to, uh, NORD has been diligent in bringing about new talent into the department. So once that comes up, the CRO program will be up and running. I would say again, from the tactical point of it, from the law enforcement point of it, continue security enhancements uh, in response for the capital area and concentrate on strategies that are going to combat issues um, because there's an alarming increase uh, of domestic violence threats against elected officials. Now the trend is not just nationally elected officials, it's state and municipally elected officials. And I'm not saying that to scare you, I'm just saying that this is where they're looking at ease of access now. And we're committed to making sure that you're safe. We always will be. Um, government facilities are always been a target. Schools, uh, faith-based entities that we're seeing now, especially um, our, 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 our friends uh, and neighbors in the Jewish community. And, and now more than ever, we're seeing uh, targets against the LGBTQIA. Um, so we have to make sure we're diligent. And we have, in Montpelier, we have the most critical resource uh, infrastructures in the state. And our officers need to be ready to respond to any possible threat that we can find, that, that can find us, um, whether it's domestic or foreign terrorism. I would also, uh, and I know this is a priority for NORD, is to look at reestablishing that SRO, the School Resource Officer Program, and uh, bringing officers back to federal task force positions within the department. Uh, again, advocate for modern statewide use of force tactics that minimize um, positional asphyxiation, keeps knees, arms, weight off the head, neck, and spine. We have the training to do that. We just have to get it approved through the state. And because we've been doing use of force tactics since it's the same stuff since the mid 70s and we need to evolve beyond that and it's going to take push the political pr pressure and will to change that there are tactics available to keep people from dying from positional asphyxiation and unintended consequences like that we just have to do them um, Advocate to modernize statewide L enforcement training, looking at flexibility um, and, and improving reciprocity for people coming from outside the state and being certified as police officers in state, that we have to go after proactive, uh, proactively. Yeah, that took me two years to get my level three certification. So certified, yeah. they, they, they gave up on the last one. They said, we don't have training, so we're gonna give it to you. He, and Nord's literally been following me around with a leash. I did not get my level three certification until roughly five months ago, and they gave up. I had one training to go, and they gave up. They're like, we, we, we don't see we're gonna offer it sooner, we're just gonna <laughs> sign off on it, here you go. So, uh, <laughs> so we have to do that. Um, uh, human trafficking, um, that's, a, that's a hard discussion for, for anybody. Um, but while we stand here talking about these things today, there are, there are people suffering here in Vermont, and we have to find a way to bring that into the light, because um, uh, there are not there there are far too few resources that are being used 
to fight human trafficking in our state. Uh, we need to coordinate with the, ACL, uh, with the ATF to pursue a, a grant program that they have um, for canines to continue our strong partnership with federal agencies and we have to continue to invest in a very robust uh, succession plan. Um, so with that being said, um, on a, again, on a personal note, uh, it is extraordinarily difficult and bittersweet. Um, but I thank you for the privilege uh, to serve you. And I thank Bill, Cameron, Kelly uh, for your faith in me because I came here damaged. I came here as, as, uh, as a... 124 uh, applications putting into other places and they wouldn't touch me because of, of where I, what I came from. But you have faith in me. So thank you and I wanna thank Nord uh, for his, his continued guard, guard mentorship and especially the, uh, the men and women of the Montpelier Police Department. It has been a true honor. Uh, it has been the highlight of my career um, and this was never meant to be a stepping stone. This, is, this was the pinnacle of, of where I want it to be. And if I could imagine what a police department should be, it's this. And that the, uh, to the members of the community, thank you for your support, your outpouring of support to my family, to myself. And uh, you need to know that you have, um, know your blessings because you have a, a city council and you have a police department and you have a, a team of staff members of this city that are committed undoubtedly and unapologetically to serving this community. So uh, thank you for the opportunity and I, and I will answer any questions that you may have of me. What's that? Oh yes, well, uh, I before I say a few things. It's late, boss. We gotta get moving. That's <laughs> okay. You, you know, this is worth it. Um, if if other folks have things that they would like to say, I'm, that would be welcome now. But and I'll, I'll save my comments to the end if other folks have things they want to say, or you don't have to. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Yeah, no. I just say like you know, seeing Dan Toll get up there. This is somebody who's like a kind of vocal member of the police review force. He disagree with you a lot, but it's a testament to you that I think you changed a lot of people's minds of what they thought of law enforcement. And the community, I think, really gave a collective sigh when they heard the news you were leaving. And, uh, you know, you, you entered in such a difficult period here where, you know, recruitment retention was rough. And you could have, like, you could have filled the police department with a bunch of people who would be subpar and negatively affect this town for, like, ages to go. But you didn't. You, you worked understaffed, you know. You did the patrol yourself. You did what, uh, you know, Deputy uh, Norrinson said. You, you chose good people and, you know, made them good cops. And I think someone like Sergeant Matthews is a great example of that, too. You know, you see the, the, the confidence and the great things she's doing, you know. Um, but honestly, Chief, it's... Uh, you know, it's, it's really with a heavy heart to see you go there. And, uh, you know, I, I've learned so much from you. And, I, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, you, you got to do what you got to do, but you, you will be missed, sir. You, you will indeed. It's Thank you, sir. You're in good hands. You're in damn good hands. <laughs> oh, we are. Any other thoughts? Go ahead, Warren. Yeah, I just wanted to thank you, Chief. Um, you know, as one of the people who served on the Police Review Committee, you know, that was tons of work and a lot of really hard conversations and really pushing and, you know, right in the midst of the George Floyd murder and all of that. So, like, super intense, COVID's going on, and it was, it was just, a, like, an honor to work with you. I learned so much from you. I think the community learned a lot, you know, and I think together, like you said, we, like, had push and pull, and it was a really healthy and transparent and honest debate and conversation. And I'm just, I'm really grateful and I just really appreciate the communication you've brought to the community and the structures you've built. So I think the legacy that you're leaving too, you know, I, like I'll miss you, you'll be missed. And you built systems, you know, you came into a strong department 
and continue to build on those. And so I think, you know, with our new incoming chief, so much to build on and a great department you're leaving behind. So I think that's just such a testament to, to your leadership of, you know, building that longevity of these values. So I'll miss you. Go ahead, Jeff. I'll follow up on what Lauren said. Because uh, as, as someone else who worked on the Police Review Commission, and it was tough. It, it was a lot of meetings, a lot of hours, um, a lot of time for you to listen to people that uh, didn't agree with where you were coming from or, or had definitely different uh, perspectives. I thought it was very impressive and valuable that no matter how clear you were in your own views, you were never defensive or uncooperative. It, your ability to listen to the uh, and engage with the, the debate was part of what made it uh, a successful, uh, successful process. And uh, coming up with the new pol with new policies, uh, adopting policies and implementing policies has been uh, has been very productive for the city. And uh, I think we're in a better place than uh, than we were when when you came. So, like everyone else, I'll I'll miss you here in the community. And good luck where you're going. Yes, I've already kind of said goodbye, um, but I mean, everybody's already saying things and I'm sitting here crying like a boob, so. Um, <laughs> just thank you for making me feel safe. That is probably one of the biggest gifts. Big bad LA girl, don't like cops. I really like you. <laughs> and I really appreciate how easy it is to just sit and talk with you. You're not this mean, scary, intimidating guy. And um, my defenses are down now when I am around police officers. And I attribute that to the police department here, but also to you. So thank you for that gift. And um, you'll be my thoughts as you travel, so. Thank you, and your gift has a special place of honor in my home. Thank you. Yay, good. I'm so glad. Travel. Yes, ma'am. Um, I just say thank you and echo what everyone else has said. And um, you know, Montpelier is better off for having had you here. And it, it's a real loss to have you go. And uh, the just the 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 impact that you've had on people's perception of the police. You know, I think that we, that's what a lot of people here have said, and I think that that's been just so obvious from everywhere in the community. And I thank you for that. That will last after you go. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Well, so I have. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I also want to thank you. It has been an extraordinary, um, wonderful pleasure uh, on my behalf to work with you, and I'm so grateful that I had this opportunity to, to get to know you and to, and to work with you. Um, I also want you to know that uh, that list of suggestions, that those final thoughts that you had, I want you to know that even as I step into a, a different role, I am taking all of those thoughts to heart um, and I really appreciate and trust your opinion uh, about about those things, and um, I'm, I look forward to working together with the legislature on some of those points. Um, also, the, this list of accomplishments that the department has achieved over the last two years, I, also, I can't believe it's only been two years that you've done all of this incredible work. Uh, you did all of that through a pandemic, right? Like, you could have had all the excuse in the world to say, nah, we don't have the capacity, we don't have the, um, you know, we don't have the, the staff to work on these things, but no, like you um, helped push the department forward even when it was hard. And also through two of the most difficult years that it's probably been to be a police officer anywhere in the country. Um, and so, and you carried the department uh, through this extraordinarily difficult time. Uh, and in fact, didn't just, didn't just carry it, made it better. And that is, 
just absolutely remarkable. I want you to know that we are extraordinarily proud of you. We're proud of the department. Um, I want to thank you for everything that you've brought to the department and to our community um, because we are a better place, specifically because you were here and served with us, for us. And so with that, I, uh, uh, it is my pleasure and my honor to present you with a couple of things. So one is just a, a, a small gift, um, but the other is a key to the city of Montpelier. She's not going to tell you what door it goes to. Looks like they don't lock that door. Turn, turn a little bit. Oh, we gotta, we gotta look this way. Oh. Look this way. <laughs> I can throw it at somebody. I can think of one person. It's also a, a beer opener, I believe. <laughs> yes. Bottle opener. I'll use it for a beer. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much. I appreciate you. And I'll thanks, just say thanks, honestly. Chief. We've had a chance to talk. So. Um, but I will say, um, well, you're all here, so yes, I will thank you, Chief. We've had many private moments. Uh, best gamble I ever took uh, <laughs> was hiring you. And um, one of the things that you accomplished, as you talked a lot about, was your succession planning. So I'm going to give everybody a sneak preview of a public announcement for tomorrow, and that is Eric Nordenson will be our next Chief of Police starting December 21st. <laughs> He learned from two or three of the best, Chief Pete, Chief Fakus, and Chief Hoyt, and he's been here almost as long as I have. <laughs> I think we were talking about that the other day, and uh, wow, I remember him as a rookie. And uh, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> no, he's going to be great. Uh, he is a tough act to follow. Uh, the support from the department, from the community, uh, and from the prior chiefs for him was outstanding. And uh, Chief Pete, I thank you for leaving Deputy Chief, soon to be Chief Nordenson, in, in, in a place, better place than he was three years ago when he wasn't interested in this job. <laughs> so you've done a great job with that and bringing along all, all your folks. So congrats to Eric mm -hmm. and congratulations to you, Chief. Good luck moving on. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right, well, so moving on to um, our next uh, item here. Um, so we um, had a, a question about whether we should um, have a, a, a public hearing about this. Um, so just so you know my thoughts on this, and I'm open to other um, thoughts, uh, I, I think we pr probably do need to go into executive session to um, discuss uh, what, what we're going to do and that we could have a, a, a public uh, hearing as, as has been requested, but I think that's something that we could also discuss um, in executive session. Um, that, as I said, the one does not necessarily preclude the other. Um, so that, that would be my suggestion. And I, if we do a public hearing, I would suggest that it's not tonight. Um, so that's, it was, yeah. So, I would suggest that we go into executive session and we may come out and have uh, an action um, or a course of action we want to take. Um, other thoughts? Yep, I'm seeing some thumbs up, some nods, okay. Uh, do you have a comment you'd like to make? Yeah. Oh, if you would come up to the microphone, that'd be great. Sure, that's today. fine. Um, gee, after all of that emotional, you know, feel-good stuff, you know, it's like a now this. <laughs> um, when you say go into executive session and then some action, but that action would not entail or involve making a decision relative to whether um, my uh, appointment to the commission is rescinded, right? 
there would have to be the public hearing first, correct? It could not be based upon because, as I said previously, uh, if, if, if your discussion and then subsequent decision is going to be based upon the memorandum which you received, um, <clears throat> and I know it wasn't, I mean, it's like one does one's best. Nothing's ever going to be 100% perfect. Uh, but there are some couple of glaring, glaring um, omissions in that report, which I think of a profound importance. And uh, I would feel um, I, I, I would feel um, I would feel abused, frankly, if a decision was made because again, as I said earlier, this to you is an agenda item. To me, it's about my character. And um, if I may say something just on a personal note, since the year 2009, I'm 74 years of age. Since the year 2009, except for one year during for the COVID thing, I go to India twice a year to go on meditation retreats. My meditation retreats are, it's what I call my spiritual IRA. My time on this planet is very, very limited. The truth is extremely important to me. You know, I've been a vegetarian since the time I was 20 years of age because I believe that animals are our younger brothers and sisters. So the truth and my preparing for my next lifetime uh, is very, very important to me. People could, who know me could say, you know, Tom, you know, you could describe him as being contrary, contentious, maybe even irascible. But sleaze is one word that p people would never, ever say about me. And the, the, uh, the kinds of innuendos and the kinds of assertions that were made about my behavior, the things that I said. But this, relative to that, there's just one very, very important fact about Monica that was omitted in Bill's report, which is very, very germane to this matter at hand, and that is this. When I went to see her poetry reading at the, uh, and you all have read the memorandum, when I went to see her at the poetry reading, at the very outset of her reading, she said to everybody present, six or eight of us, she said, <clears throat> my artwork and my poetry are helping me heal from my traumatic brain injury. I went online and I, what is this? After all this brouhaha, and this is a fact, it's not like something, uh, and this is why I say, I mentioned this to Bill, but it's not in the report. I went online and I was like, well, okay, what is traumatic brain injury? The very first thing they're talking about is a person suffers from an anxiety and that they have emotional responses that are disproportionate to reality. So I did not want to say this here. I wanted to say it, you know, like maybe, but there was no opportunity to do that. So I'm sorry, but it's coming out this way. But as I say, it's about my character. So thank you. I will wait here, I guess, until you do whatever. Uh, and just so you know, we, we may come out and make a decision. Um, I think that is possible. Um, but we'll, we can talk about um, what we're obligated to do. Um, Okay, so with that, is there a motion? I move that we go into executive session pursuant to 1 BSA section 313A3 uh, regarding the appointment or employment or evaluation of a public officer. And uh, I, I just want to point out as uh, as we're discussing this, and based on uh, your comment, Mayor, that uh, 
I don't think there's anything that requires the us to go into executive session that okay. it is possible it's it's always discretionary with the public ballot body so it's possible to not do this in executive session but there's more than one public uh, officer involved and so that's part of the reason that I think it's appropriate to go into executive session and I'll also point out to the council and the members of the public who are in attendance that uh, the statutes also provide that no uh, final or binding decision can be made except in public session. So whatever is mm -hmm. discussed, discussed in executive session, the public final vote would be in public session. Yep. I would second that. Yep. Oh, okay. Then. So motion and a second. Further discussion? Okay, um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. All right, so we will be back at least to adjourn um, and possibly to have some, some further motion. We'll see. Okay, thanks. Okay. <clears throat> okay, is there a motion to come out of executive session? So moved. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. And opposed? All right, uh, Jack. Pursuant to Section 317B of the Montpelier City Charter, I move that Tom Mulholland be removed from the uh, Public Art Commission. Second. Is further discussion? Um, okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? All right, well, thank you. We just want to recognize it was not an, uh, an appointment that was um, working out for the committee. Um, so I'm um, assuming that we're going to reopen um, advertising for that committee. Um, and uh, so um, with that, we'll move on to, so thank you, and we'll move on to um, our council reports, and we're going to start with Donna. Okay, happy holidays, everyone. <laughs> That's all I have to say. Okay, <laughs> Carrie. I don't have any report, thank you. Okay, Connor. I'll, I'll pass. Uh, Jennifer. Okay, Jack. Also passing, it's very late. <laughs> Lauren. It is super late. I will also pass John. Nope. Okay. Ooh. Bill. The pressure's on. <laughs> unfortunately, yeah. unfortunately, I can't pass. Um, but I will try to do this quickly. Uh, already announced Chief Nordenson's appointment effective next Wednesday. We are going to do a little swearing in for him with uh, Chief Pete, Chief Fakus, and Chief Hoyt present. Uh, and obviously family. Um, I mentioned to the, I, th I can't remember who I mentioned this to, either the com Capital Committee or all of you, but the group working on the Country Club Road would like to have a special meeting on January 18 with you, Council, on Wednesday night. Uh, that's an off week night for us, so that we have the whole night to go through their plans and their thinking and the designs. They've got two or three design options, and I think they want to. And then that's going to be followed up with a uh, public meeting on site on the basically the same pattern they did last time It'll be on January 28 on site January 2nd here in City Council and then I forget the other January 9th maybe I can't January 9th, thank you uh, online so uh, they would like to if that is okay with you I didn't I couldn't commit without checking with you what are the dates of that again sorry so the the, the main thing is the January 18 mm -hmm. special meeting here for the council to brief the council the uh, then we can send you out the others but can are you available that evening it's a non it's a third Wednesday we had kind of held it as a possible budget workshop 6 30 yeah even if I wanted to be here I'm, I, well, I will yeah. not you, I'm yeah. otherwise obligated anyway right yeah. so so for the five of you that will still be on the count okay great then we will schedule that um, we are very close on a finance director. Hopefully we'll also have an announcement on that by next week. Uh, if not the end of this week, we'll see. Very close. And uh, just our capital committee meeting left our meeting saying at the end of the meeting tonight, we decide whether we want to meet again tomorrow, next week. And we said we'd wait. So now there's no more time to wait. <laughs> so, so. Wait, I'm sorry. The members of the Capital Improvement oh, okay. Committee, Improvement Committee. Yeah, yeah, 
the question was, do you want to get together again next week before the council meeting? And the answer was, let's wait and hear the whole budget. Let's see how it goes, and we'll decide at the end of the meeting. And I would say this is definitely the end of the meeting. Mm. <laughs> it's, um, sorry, the, now, sorry. Now's like not quite the right time to to ask that question. But um, well, we, if you want to ask a question, we can do that in a minute. But right now, um, the question is for the capital improvement right. committee. So the, the members of the capital improvement committee. Uh, Either way is fine. There's no right or wrong answer. Just do your, don't you? Are you there? No, you're not there. Yeah, I feel like we could address anything in the full budget discussion. I don't. Okay. I think we got the information we needed, so I think no. Okay. If everyone's comfortable, okay. I'd say no. Okay. okay. Great. <laughs> okay. Thank Thank you. Great. That's the end of my. That's all I have. Is that Thank anything you else? Um, did you have anything further you'd like to say? No. Uh, okay. No, it's, it's a question. Okay. Is that well, all there is? is there no explanation as to why you came to that determination? Uh, that is all there is. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So um, with that, I think that is it. Um, so without objection, we will consider the meeting adjourned. Phew. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.